Hello, 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 and let me make sure my mic is on. <laughs> Welcome to Friday night's live stream. Um, please tell me that you can hear me and see me. I can see you commenting, but I can't, I don't see like the view count right now. So I'm not sure if you guys can actually hear and see me. So let me just see. Let's see. Can you guys hear and see me? There's a bit of a delay, it looks like. Hold on. Uh-oh. I can't tell. Hey, Candy Renee. Hey, Ginger McNinja. Hello to all 100 of you that are here right now. Oh, boy. I don't know. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> it took a little while to catch up. Hello. Happy Fry, yay. Hello, everybody. Let me just make sure that it's on the correct. Oh my God, I pull my sleeve down. <laughs> Let me just make sure that it's on the correct setting for my audio. Um, yep, it's on the correct setting. Can you guys hear me okay? Hello, everyone. Please take your shoes off, get comfortable, and like the video as you're coming in. My name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I've been a criminal defense attorney for 13 years now, going on 14. <laughs> and it's so nice to see every single one of you. I hope that you're all doing very, very well today. Um, it has been a very busy week. I am in trial. My trial is adjourned until Tuesday. So that's why I'm able to come to you guys tonight. I tried to come to you last night, but I had to do some things for my trial that made it impossible for me to do that. But I can take a little bit of a break, a little bit of a breather, because I'll be back to working tomorrow. And I said, you know what? Let me do that break with my beautiful lawyer chicklets. And in case you do not know, if you are a subscriber to this channel, you are a lawyer chicklet. If you are a member, you are a lawyer chicklet. It. And if you graduate, you then become a rooster. Um, so please make sure that you um, go ahead and click the like button, subscribe if you have not subscribed, hit the notification bell so that you know every single time that I go live because I do not have a set schedule, baby. I do not. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible for me to have a set schedule and be a practicing public defender. It's just not a possible thing for me. I would like to shout out Olay on Twitter. She is a attorney in the state of New York. And she was on the Breakfast Club um, interviewing, debating Mayor Eric Adams of New York. And she did a phenomenal job. I highly recommend, it's available on YouTube, highly recommend that you guys go and check that out. Thank you for saying you like my makeup. This is all day makeup. I literally just sprayed some Urban Decay setting spray on my face just now. I didn't do anything but put on lip gloss and spray that Urban Decay and then like pat it in with a little bit of powder. It's the same oily stuff that I've had on all day. So <laughs> thank you for recognizing that it, that it looks good because I was a little, it was a little touch and go there for a second. <laughs> it was a little bit touch and go there for a second. So we are here to talk about the Diddy complaint. Um, the Diddy complaint, Diddy has been raided by the feds. Um, there's just been a lot. So there is a timeline of events that we're going to be getting to. Um, and there's been some updates in all of his lawsuits. Oh, my goodness. It's a mess. It's a mess. Okay. So I think people has a pretty good timeline. Here's the thing. I know you guys are going to say, oh, this powder, sometimes I use Fit Me by L'Oreal, which is drugstore and amazing quality setting powder. They have a yellow kind of banana -y powder. Um, well, it's not really, it's not called yellow, but it's, you know, something like that. And then uh, the one I'm wearing today is Laura Mercier. That's what I have on today, but that's like a high-end one. The mid-range or low low range price one is Fit Me by L'Oreal, which is affordable and just as good, in my opinion, as Laura Mercier. The powder is not as finely milled, but it still really has good staying power. Powder. Power. <laughs> did he? He did. <laughs> I 
I want to welcome our new member, um, La Mama T. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all 400 of you that are here in the first five minutes of this live stream. That is great. But in order to kind of, you know, the 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 re the rewatched people, you know, they don't like all the extra stuff. And so I'm going to do them a solid today. And we're going to start right with the main topic. So let's get to our main topic. Diddy has been raided by the feds, okay? His LA and Miami homes have been raided by the feds. His children were put in custody um, because anyone that is present when a search warrant is being, um, uh, when a search warrant is being uh, issued, not issued, but served, um, those people are going to be detained uh, so that the officers can make sure that they don't destroy evidence, uh, so that they can make sure that nothing is tampered with and for the safety of everyone the people that are present in the home at the time of the service of the warrant will be detained. And oftentimes a warrant service will also come with an arrest warrant. So for your everyday person, that's normally the case, but not so with the feds. A lot of the times the federal government will do their own investigation that includes service on warrants on homes without an arrest warrant yet, because it's a part of them doing investigation into the crime. And then once they think they have enough probable cause, then that is when an arrest warrant will possibly be issued. So we know now the cat is out the bag that there is a federal investigation for um, trafficking, you know, I, and again, I would just ask you guys to just like you did with the Jody Hildebrandt um, eight passengers, Ruby Frankie live stream that I did with Dr. Barry in our last live stream, which was so greatly um, appreciated and supported by you guys. Thank you so much for the support on that video. I want to talk in real terms. And so that's going to mean that YouTube is not going to like that. And that's okay. This is their business. They get to run things how they want, but it means, you know, less monetization, which is fine. So I'm just going to ask you to be as supportive of your, as you're able to be. And if not, just your like is enough to support. But let's just say what it is. Diddy is being investigated for human trafficking. Um, it is believed that he takes people across state lines in order to engage in prostitution against those people's will. That is what's being alleged in a lot of these lawsuits. That's the essence of them. And if you take somebody across state lines for the purpose of prostitution against that person's will, you're getting into federal territory because you're crossing state lines in order to commit a crime. The same goes for the Jane Doe lawsuit against Diddy, right? So, Diddy has this lawsuit by this woman that says that they took her from one state, flew her on a private jet to another state. She has pictures of herself at the Bad Boy Studios in the 90s and that she was then forced to have intercourse with Mr. Harrell and Sean P. Diddy Combs. So we went through that lawsuit. We went through this lawsuit that we're going to be covering the amended complaint of that lawsuit from Little Rod. So let's take a look at the timeline as told by People Magazine. Here's the thing. You guys do not like it when I go to certain sources and I want to say what this is. You don't like it when I use people, CNN. Um, you don't like it when I use Yahoo even, which is pretty neutral as far as I'm concerned. Fox News, when I've used them as a source, you guys haven't liked that. You're not going to like every single news source that I reference to. It's just impossible uh, because that is the nature of media and all media has a slant unless you're talking about maybe NPR and well, to me, NPR is an unbiased and unslanted, but other people don't see it that way. I see the associated press as unbiased and unslanted, but other people don't see it that way. So, uh, people, we can agree to disagree and you are free to pull upon your own sources. So that's just a caveat. So also as a trigger warning, we're going to be talking about sexual assault, human trafficking, um, uh, you know, things of that nature, drug use, if those things, and I'm going to talk about homophobia at the end of the stream. If those things are something that bothers you, that are going to, it's going to upset you. It's going to make you have a bad weekend. Tune out. You don't have to watch this live stream because you don't have to ingest anything that's going to make you not feel good on the inside. We will have another video for you that will be more your speed. So let's keep it going. A timeline of Sean Diddy Combs sexual assault allegations and lawsuits. So this is the raid happening at Diddy's residence right here. Sean Diddy Combs is facing a number of sexual assault allegations. 
the f rapper first made headlines in November 2023. That wasn't the first time he made headlines, but that was the biggest headline. When his ex, Cassie, filed a bombshell lawsuit against him, alleging that the music mogul had sex with her against her will and sex trafficked her over the course of an abusive 10 years. In her complaint filed against Combs in New York, she claimed that she was stuck in a decade-long cycle of abuse, violence, and sex trafficking. And we went through that lawsuit. That included a 2018 assault after she tried to leave him and multiple instances of domestic violence. The lawsuit also resolved to their mutual satisfaction a day later, which again, record breaking. Never heard of that before. Someone got on me on Twitter. It wasn't a day later. It is. It is a day after the lawsuit was filed. It's settled. That is record breaking. With some alleging Diddy um, of abuse, sex trafficking, and gang assault. On December 6th, Diddy spoke out about the allegations. Enough is enough. Okay. Um, okay. In her complaint filed against Combs in New York, she claimed, uh, this is Cassie, that she was stuck in a, okay, I got that. Okay. I thought I missed something. He said, enough is enough. For the last couple of weeks, I've sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my char character, destroy my reputation and legacy. Um, sickening allegations have been made against me by individuals looking for a quick payday. Uh, in March 2024, his properties, and here's the thing is, I'll say this. On one hand, some of that could be true, that there are people looking for a payday. But on the other hand, given the settlement, and this is the second settlement, because there was one a couple of years ago, I think it was like a private chef or some, somebody like that, that had sued him for sexual assault, and he settled that as well. I am going to take that, me personally, not lawyer Natalie, human Natalie, I am going to take that as you did something. You did something and that is why you're settling. So you did something. That's why you're settling. But there could be other people that are coming after you for money. But I don't feel sorry for you because you out here sexually assaulting people. So if you get picked apart by the vultures, oh, well, you know, that's how I personally feel about it. But I'm still going to look at each case for its own merit. So in March 2024, this was just a couple days ago, his properties were raided by federal agents, which a Homeland Security Investigations representative told people was part of an ongoing invest investigation. November 16, 2023, Diddy's ex accuses him of rape. We went through that. November 17, 2023, Diddy and Cassie settled the lawsuit the very next day. November 23rd, he's accused of sexual assault by another woman. So days after settling his lawsuit with Cassie, Diddy was accused of sexual assault and lawsuit filed in Manhattan Supreme Court. See, this is missing the one that happened before Cassie. There was one before Cassie that has settled. According to the court documents obtained by people, a woman named Joy Dickerson Neal accused Diddy of drugging and raping her when she was a college student at Syracuse University in 1991. Attorneys for Dickerson Neal claimed she was the victim of revenge porn after the music mogul allegedly recorded the incident and shared the tape with others in the music industry. Disgusting. At the time of the filing which occurred as the New York State Adult Survivors Act window was about to close. And let's talk about that real quick. So New York State um, opened up the statute of limitations for old allegations of sexual abuse. This was in the wake of the Me Too movement. And I think a good thing did come of that. And that was that back in the day, it used to be very, very hard to pursue charges for sexual assault against people. It really, really was. And so your window would close and that would be it. And so they gave them like this, like holiday basically and said, come on back, try your case, file your case, do what you want to do with your case. And it, it was only a, a small window where they had to file. So that window was about to close. Diddy denied the allegations, claiming Dickerson Neal fabricated the story. This last minute lawsuit is an example of how a well intentioned law can be turned on its head. Miss Dickerson's 32 year old story, it was old, is made up and not credible. Mr. Combs never assaulted her, and she implicates companies that did not exist. This is purely a money grab and nothing else. We went through that lawsuit. And in that lawsuit, there were allegations against bad boy and things like that. These businesses did not exist at the time. Um, however, she, we had Sean Combs starting as the music mogul, and she alleges that he filmed her while he raped her and then distributed the video to shame her to other people. So whether or not the businesses existed has nothing to do with whether or not, well, I shouldn't say has nothing to do because it could be an issue of credibility, right? But it's not... Um, it's, it's not dispositive of the case. Let's put it that way. 
Then on November 23rd, 2023, Diddy faces a third sexual assault lawsuit that same day. Diddy was accused of sexual assault by a third woman, according to a lawsuit filed by New York County Supreme Court in the New York County Supreme Court. In the lawsuit obtained by people, a Jane Doe, we also went through this lawsuit, alleged that Diddy and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall took turns raping her and a friend in New York City more than 30 years ago. And then Diddy said these are fabricated claims, falsely alleging misconduct from over 30 years ago and filed at the last minute. This is nothing but a money grab. Because of Mr. Combs' fame and success, he is an easy target for anonymous accusers who lie without conscience and, or consequence for financial benefit. The spokesperson added, the New York legislature surely did not intend or expect the Adult Survivors Act to be exploited by scammers. The public should be skeptical and not rush to accept these bogus allegations. So Aaron Hall cannot be reached for, content, uh, for comment, but I will tell you that an update on this lawsuit is that a judge has ruled that this Jane Doe plaintiff must reveal her identity. She must reveal her identity it is not allowed for her to proceed in this case anymore as a Jane Doe. The judge says that they understood her concerns for her safety, her concerns for her privacy. But if you're going to be filing this lawsuit in a court of public <laughs> or in a, in a public court, because our courts here are public in the United States, not a court of public opinion, but the public court, that's what I meant to say, um, then she's going to need to reveal her identity. So we'll see what happens with that. I'm not sure if her identity has yet been revealed. I'm not sure if she's going to want to proceed with the case now that she has been told she has to step down. She has to reveal her identity. I was reading and talking at the same time. So November 28, 2023, just a few days later, Diddy temporarily steps aside as revolt chairman. We don't really need to get into that. December 6, he is accused of sex traffic, trafficking and gang assault by a fourth woman, a fourth woman. In early December, this is the one with her Pierre. In early December, Diddy was accused of sexual assault by a fourth victim in a lawsuit filed in New York by a woman under the name Jane Doe um, accused Diddy, former bad boy entertainment president Harv Pierre, and the third individual labeled as the third assailant, but that's because she didn't know who they were, of sex trafficking, gang assault when she was 17 years old. This is the one, this is the one where they, she said they flew her out on the private jet. In the filing obtained by People, Jane Doe claimed that Pierre approached her at a lounge in Michigan and convinced her to take a private jet with him and a third assailant to Combs recording studio in New York City. Once she arrived, she alleged she was given drugs and alcohol before being viciously gang assaulted. Now, there is a similarity in all of these narratives. That does not mean that he is guilty or that he did it because these are all public narrative. People could be making these things up. However, the fact that the feds are investigating him to the point where they have raided his home makes me think that where there's smoke, there may be some fire with at least one or two of these plaintiffs. That's just my opinion. However, please remember, Sean P. Diddy Combs is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. He has not been proven guilty of anything. He has not been found liable for anything. He has settled some cases. He has not been found guilty or liable. On December 6th, he makes a statement, enough is enough. On February 26th of this year, he's accused of sexual assault by a record producer. And this is the lawsuit that has since been amended. It mentions all type of people now. Prince Harry is mentioned, all type, you know, all types of people are mentioned, so on and so forth. This is the one that's now been amended that we're going to be talking about. So he's accused of essay by a record producer, Little Rod Jones, Rodney Lil Ron Jones, a former producer and videographer for Diddy, filed a lawsuit in New York federal court alleging the rapper previously essayed, drugged, and threatened him while he was working with Combs on his recent Love album. So here is my issue with this lawsuit. If it was only about Diddy essayed me, Diddy threatened me, Diddy uh, you know, sexually assaulted me, physically assaulted me, or whatever the case may be, then, hey, let the courts figure it out. Let the justice system do its job. I'm all for it. It's the salaciousness of the details of things that are not relevant to the ultimate claims. There are things that he's claiming in the lawsuit that he could never recover for. So that means he could never be the plaintiff for those things. Other people would be the victims of those things. And so it seems like he wants to just get those salacious details out there in order to pressure Diddy into settling the case. And that is unseemly to me. And I've always felt that way about it. I just don't think that's how an attorney should handle a lawsuit. However, that doesn't mean that what he's saying is not true. Whoop! But it makes me question some of the stuff. So then March 25th, 2024, Diddy's home is raided by federal agents. On March 25th, Diddy properties in Los Angeles and Miami were raided by federal agents earlier today. Homeland Security investigations 
HSI New York executed law enforcement actions as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, so Homeland Security Investigations, and our local law enforcement partners. We will provide further information as it becomes available. An HSI representative said these actions come amid sex trafficking allegations and two lawsuits of the five lawsuits. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, please contact the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE or 1-800-656-4673. And so or go to RAINN.org. That's RAIN.org. I am sharing that message as well because I know that a lot of these types of things can be very, very triggering. So please do me a favor, do yourselves all a favor and uh, seek counseling, help and therapy if these types of topics are very, uh, you know, difficult for you. OK. All right. So many of these, not many of these, but a couple of these lawsuits, Cassie's lawsuits, Little Rod's lawsuit essentially also um, implied sex trafficking. Um, the Jane Doe lawsuit where she said she was flown from one state to the other. That is self. Uh, that is um, sex trafficking as well. So. It makes a lot of sense to me that the feds would see all of this in the news and be like, we need to look into this. And there are people that have complaints when these lawsuits are filed. Why don't you go to the police instead of filing a lawsuit and trying to get money? And there is some you can do both. Right. You can do both there. But there is some merit to that argument, I think. And that is that if this person did this to you, they will probably do it to someone else. And just them paying you off is not going to stop them. So it would be a good idea to go to law enforcement. But there is also the part where it is difficult to report sexual assault. People have a lot of fear and stigma around sexual assault and reporting it to law enforcement. And that's why you see such a long time before the lawsuits are even brought. And then criminally, in many states, there's statute of limitations for these types of things. So I think it's completely understandable as well on the other side that people are hesitant to come forward. But if heaven forbid you are ever the victim of a sexual assault, please seek out assistance from law enforcement if you are able to and it is safe. Please, 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 because they could be hurting someone else. Okay, so there's fear that could cause people to not want to go to the police. Fear of the police, fear of retaliation from the perpetrator and they feel more comfortable proceeding through the civil process. So that might be it. And also the burden of proof is a lot lower in a civil case. It's harder to prove a case criminally beyond a reasonable doubt and much easier to prove it by the civil standard. Okay, so let us... Un momento, por favor. Necesito buscar por los documentos. Aquí. Okay. Here is Diddy's amended complaint. Let's get right to it, okay? Um, let me just make sure that you guys can see what I'm seeing. You see what I'm seeing. Awesome, awesome. Um, we're all together now. Awesome. Um, hide sidebar. Great. Okay, so we've already gone through this part of the lawsuit except it's now been amended to add where is he Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr. has been added to the lawsuit. Do you see him right here? I hope you can see my um let's see if I can get this. Hold on. Let me see. Yellow Cuba Gooding Jr. Dang, why won't it do it for me? Hold on. Ha. Uh -huh. Let's try. Hmm. I'm trying to do like the highlighty situation because in my opinion, it makes it easier to follow along when you do that. But for some reason, it won't let me. Let's try that. Hmm. Nope, it won't let me. That's okay. Okay, fine. Be, be stank if you want to. <laughs> Go ahead and give me a hard time if that's what you want to do. Okay, there he is. Cuba Gooding Jr. has been added to the lawsuit. Okay, so we know that he's requesting a jury. And let's skip through a lot of this because we covered that. You guys already know that I had issues 
with this like here's pictures of the people and here's this shady picture of Diddy because you don't need that in a lawsuit. It's unnecessary. It's taking up a lot of space. This lawsuit is overly long, but it's full of salacious details. So here's our boy Cuba Gooding Jr. who has already pled guilty in criminal court for groping women and touching women and physically and sexually assaulting women against their will. As I've told you, I've been in contact with one of his victims for which he, and I say victim because normally I wouldn't do that. I would say alleged victim, complaining witness, something like that. But he has pled guilty to assaulting her. And so apparently from what I understand, he has a history of going around and groping women. Okay, so here we go. Hold on one second. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so upon information and belief, defendant Cuban Gunner Jr. is domiciled. In oh, and the other thing was them putting their not redacting their, you know, whatever. OK, so anyway, that's Cuba Gunning Jr. He has been added to the lawsuit. So let us go forth and see some of the things that were amended and added. So we all know that Lil Rod was a child prodigy and all that stuff. I always thought that that was, you know, excessive things. In addition, he said that he witnessed the aftermath of a shooting, which I guess could go to emotional distress. And he was forced to lie and say, um, you know, <laughs> and, and say that the, 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 the shooting didn't happen where it happened. Um, we know that he alleges that Mr. Combs attempted to groom Mr. Jones into engaging in gay sex. We've already gone through that before. But as a matter of fact, let us let us read this one more time because this is the most some of the most salacious parts of the lawsuit. And I have so much issue with it. And if you haven't gone through our last live stream where we covered this last month, you might not know. Mr. Combs knew Mr. Jones looked up to and idolized music producer Stephen Aaron Jordan, Stevie J. Based on information and belief, Oh, this is the crazy part. So he was like, oh, he showed me um, porn of Stevie J. And he knows that I look up to Stevie J. And he was trying to say that because Stevie J is engaged in gay porn, I should have sex with him. Well, guess what? The screenshot that you showed of Stevie J engaged in gay sex is not Stevie J. It's an actual gay um, adult film star, right? And we talked about that in the last live stream. So let's see if they amended anything to correct for that massive mistake. Mr. Combs attempted to groom Mr. Jones into engaging in gay sex. Mr. Combs knew Mr. Jones looked up to and idolized Stevie J. Based on information and belief, Stevie J is an American DJ and record producer and television personality. And it's a lot of name dropping for no reason. Based on information and belief, Stevie J was part of Bad Boy Records and, and The Hitman. Upon information and belief in 97 this like my client told me this i don't really know it's just what my client tells me upon information and belief in 1997 stevie j won a grammy doesn't matter upon information and belief throughout the 90s stevie j produced several artists mariah carey see you Mar mariah carey and do nothing to you tevin cavill and do nothing to you notorious big big is dead 112 done nothing to you jodeci done nothing to you faith evans done nothing to you jay-z done nothing to you eve done nothing to you but you want to make sure that you mention them in this lawsuit so that it basically creates this fervor like oh my god look at all the people that were mentioned in this lawsuit he just puts their names in here to say stevie j produced music for these people how is that relevant to you being assaulted by diddy this is not even my issue with lil rod because if lil rod was assaulted you know, I'm behind him seeking justice 100%. Men can be uh, victims of assault and sexual assault just like women can, and it happens, right? A lot of times they're afraid to come forward, but I don't like the uh, way the attorney is making this lawsuit so salacious for something that is so serious. I think it should be treated a lot more formally than this, okay? So that's what I'm saying. So based on information I believe Stevie J was one of the producers of the Love album. According to Mr. Jones, Mr. Combs used access to Stevie J and his knowledge of Mr. Jones' admiration for Stevie J to groom and entice Mr. Jones to engage in homosexual acts. Mr. Combs went so far as to share a video of who he claims was Stevie J. Aha! Aha! All right, so we have got, um, okay, I don't want to redact anything. Let's not do that. I'm sorry. We have got um, this gentleman saying that Stevie J um, was engaged in, in gay sex in this video. It turns out it was not Stevie J. So now we have a footnote. 
Let's see what the footnote says, right? Nine, footnote number nine. The writer is in possession of the video and will provide a copy to the court. It is not Stevie J in the video. It is not. It is not Stevie J in the video. This is driving me crazy. And by now he should be saying, we're in possession of the video. Okay, here we go. Upon information and belief, this is new. Stevie J denies that he is the person in the video. A male porn star claimed that he was the black male in the video. Mr. Jones stands by his position that Mr. Combs provided him with the video and identified the individual in the video as Stevie J. Okay, so here's what he's saying here. Let's be fair. Before he was just, he, he made the assertion, which is defamatory, that Stevie J was engaged in gay sex in a pornography video and that uh, Diddy showed that pornography video to him in order to entice him into having sex with him. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I mean, that's, that, that is what it is, but it comes to find out that's not Stevie J. And so now he's saying, but that's what Diddy told me. And so I believe that. And it's just like, maybe you being in possession of the video should have done your research you know, get some digital media people. Maybe you don't want to search porn on your phone or your work computer, but do some research and see that this video is actually what it's purported to be before you file it in a lawsuit, you know? And that would already put me on red alert with my client to just be like, okay, let's make sure that the information we put in this lawsuit with this big trigger warning on it is accurate. So that's what some of the concern I had was. Uh um. So this graphic detail is that Stevie J was doing these graphic things, but turns out it's not Stevie J, according to Mr. Jones. And he should have put that not in a, in a footnote. He should have put that in this section. According to Mr. Jones, Mr. Combs informed Mr. Jones that he had engaged in sexual intercourse with rapper Redacted. Now, this was another big, big issue that I have with this lawsuit. Is Redacted... First of all, a 98 page lawsuit, ridiculous. Is redacted going to be described as the guy who, um, you know, beat up the Bayesian singer or something like that? Because that's how he was describing people before. Why redact them if you're going to give blind items to let us know who the person is essentially, right? Doesn't make any sense. Just put their name. But anyway, let's see who wrecked. He is a Philadelphia rapper who dated Mickey Nicki Minaj. That is Meek Mill, okay? The only rapper from Philadelphia who has ever dated Nicki Minaj is Meek Mill. So by putting that, it is not redacted. And so if anything that you say against this person isn't true, you might run into some issues. I'm not necessarily that you can be sued for defamation because there is this thing called the litigation privilege. There is this thing where you rely on what your client tells you. But after you receive all this additional information, you really should be very, very careful about besmirching people's names like this. I'm not saying that Meek Mill is innocent. I'm just saying if you're going to say Meek Mill did something that is untoward or illegal or unethical, you should put his name in there or not mention him at all. Okay, so. We got redacted R&B singer. I'm sure this is going to be either Usher or um, Chris Brown. Let's see. Redacted and Stevie J. This R&B singer, he performed at the Super Bowl, Usher, and had a successful Vegas residency. That's Usher. So they're alleging that Usher, what that Diddy said that he had sex with Meek Mill and Usher and Stevie J. And according to Mr. Jones, Mr. Combs promised to make sure that Mr. Jones wins producer of the year at the Grammys if he engaged in homosexual acts. This is something I didn't really touch on in the live stream where we dealt with this the last time, but I don't know how any sane person in the music industry would believe that someone can get them a Grammy as compensation for anything because there's a Grammy nominating committee, right? And they're in control of that. And I guess Diddy is really powerful. Maybe you're saying like, oh, he says he can stack the, the deck so that I end up with a Grammy if I have sex with him. But it's like, let's get out of wish zone, you know? And like, are you mad that you didn't get the Grammy? Is that what you're mad about? But anyway, let's get out of like fantasy world and deal with reality. And reality is that it's very unlikely that Grammys would be a compensation for anything because it's just not something that one person can give another, okay? Now we went through the whole Young Miami's cousin and my issues with saying Young Miami's cousin sexually assaulted Lil Rod. She's a, she's a woman. And he said that she performed uh, oral sex on him without his consent, which of course is not okay. But once again, 
Young Miami's cousin is still not named in this lawsuit. Not that I can see. I don't see it. Okay. Now, he is alleging sex trafficking here as well. So originally this lawsuit was, and we went through all of this before, that he was asked to procure young ladies and all types of stuff like that. So let's go here. The Love Album. Throughout his time with Mr. Combs, Mr. Jones was under an implied work for hire agreement, which means that you did not get a contract which you should have. According to Mr. Jones, he was not compensated for his time living with Mr. Combs or for the songs he produced. Should have gotten a contract. Okay, so we did go through all this. We did go through all this. Okay, I'm going to skip this because I want to get to the new stuff. Oh, God. No, I got to. I got to. I got to. Some of this is new. Some of this is new. Okay, so let's get here with these photographs. Okay. Let's, okay. Let me, let me stay with my instincts. So they had this type of work for hire agreement that wasn't actually in the contract. But Mr. Jones informed Mr. Santella that he required the following to work on the Love album. $20,000 per song, four royalty points, credit as producer, and credited for each instrument Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones played. And Mr. Jones must retain his publishing rights. According to Mr. Jones, they agreed to the terms detailed above after meeting with Frankie Santella. I hope you have the actual contract. Mr. Jones met with defendant Combs, who further reiterated and guaranteed that the above mentioned terms were accepted. So this is like a breach of contract thing. As a result, Mr. Jones began working on the album. Uh, one second. This is him saying that he was assaulted by Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr. forcibly touching Mr. Jones on Mr. Combs's yacht. And we already know Cuba Gooding Jr. doesn't know how to keep his hands to himself and I am comfortable with saying that because he has been convicted and pled guilty in a court of law for sexually assault for touching people against their will so this guy is saying Lil Rod that Cuba Gooding Jr. touched him in a sexual way against his will okay we'll see so he says he has this screenshot as a full video so he has a video of that of him being touched Mr. Gooding Jr. has a storied history of sexually assaulting and forcibly touching individuals against their will. Women, yes, but again, it doesn't mean that you can't cross over, you know, a sexual assaulter, you know, who knows what limits and boundaries they actually have, but still. As evidence, he was listed as a producer for the following songs, Deliver Me, Stay Part One, Reach In, What's Love, Stay A While, Moments, Need Somebody, Homecoming, and Tough Love. Mr. Combs and defendants, LRMR and UMG, benefited from Mr. Jones's work product. They failed to compensate Mr. Jones for his work. Again, verbal contracts are contracts, but they're harder to prove in court because you need to have some type of extrinsic evidence of that contract, you know, either from like the performance or, you know, prior payment or something like that to show that this verbal contract actually existed. I am very surprised that we are dealing with the music industry here and Puffy well, you know, I'm from the 80s and 90s, so I call him Puffy still in my mind. But P. Diddy or Diddy or whatever, or Love, whatever his name is these days, um, is notoriously a shady businessman, allegedly, within these streets. And so to enter into a business contract with him and not to get a written contract is very, very strange to me. But we'll see what the courts bear out. I could see this going forward. According to Mr. Jones, he attempts to work with Mr. Combs to secure his publishing and royalty rights for the work he completed. Mr. Combs only offered Mr. Jones $29,000 for 13 months, thousands of, hours of, thousands of hours of work and nine songs that made it to the Love album. Mr. Jones was willing to take $50,000, his publishing and royalties. Mr. Combs' self-serving greed would not allow him to pay Mr. Jones an additional $21,000. We already knew that he was complaining about this. But once again, I want to see that these terms are in writing. It doesn't mean that the contract didn't exist. It just makes me a little bit more skeptical. Mr. Combs' deceptive business practices became so bad that Jones was left with no choice other than to make a public plea on social media for Combs to pay him for his work. After publicly requesting that Combs do the right thing and pay him fairly, Jones received an onslaught of threatening messages from Stevie J and Love Records a and um, DeForest Taylor, 19. As the A&R of Love Records, DeForest Taylor did not require Mr. Jones or any other creatives, musicians, or artists to sign an NDA. Okay. <laughs> I'm assuming not since here this lawsuit is. But again, a, a, an NDA cannot get you out of criminal liability. It just can't. 
It just cannot. Okay. You can contract like, Hey, NDAs are really for don't share trade secret secrets. You know, don't share you, you work in my home. Please don't share the intimate things that you see in my home. But if you see me, you know, assaulting someone in my home or hurting a child or something like that. I cannot NDA my way out of that. I can pay you off for your silence, but what is that? That's bribery. That's another crime, right? So that is not a legally enforceable contract. So here's DeForest, uh, I guess, texting with him. You playing, I'm in studio. LOL, you 100% liar and weirdo. Good luck. Number still the same. There, that's just him arguing with him. Um, and this is a text message saying that DeForest Taylor was threatening Mr. Jones. And I guess this guy in the middle is DeForest Taylor. Okay. I already said before, I don't see these text messages as threatening. He says to come talk to me on a public podcast and forum. That is not a threat. It's, it, that is inherently non-threatening. I want to debate something with you in public, not I want to beat you up, you know? Uh, one second, guys. Hey, Siri. Call Brando. Uh-huh. Call Brando. One second. Okay, we've hit 1,000 viewers in this live stream. Hello to all 1,000 of you. Thank you so, so much for rocking with this channel. You guys are amazing. All right, let's keep it going. So now I am comfortable to go down a little bit. Um, so Mr. Combs uses power and influence to threaten and intimidate Mr. Jones. Combs is, a, is very, okay, we already know this. We already know this. Um, he's like including every bad thing that's ever been said about him. Every bad thing that ever been thin. Okay, so this is um, his enforcer, Fahim Muhammad. Um, okay. Jazz is getting it out there, huh? Okay, I think the original. Oh, wait one second. Okay, so Lucian Charles Grange, I guess, okay, so this guy, okay, okay, okay. Skip all this. Listen to this. Defendant Christina Corum is the uh, Jelaine, or J I think it's Jelaine, Jelaine Maxwell to Sean Combs' Jeffrey Epstein. According to Mr. Jones, during the 13 months he lived and traveled with Mr. Combs, He witnessed Mr. Combs display and distribute guns from his bedroom closets in Miami, Florida. See, this is just what this is right here is like, you didn't want to pay me. I got you because this isn't even allegations of anything he's done against Lil Rod. And this is probably what got the feds interested. So him putting Combs next to uh, Epstein and Jelaine Ma Maxwell is very, very interesting choice. This is for the public. This is not for the lawsuit. According to Mr. Jones, during the 13 months he lived and traveled with Mr. Combs, he witnessed defendant Corum openly order her ass assistance to keep Mr. Combs high off gummies and pills. Defendant Corum required all employees from the butler to the chef to the housekeepers to rock a walk around with a black product pouch or fanny pack filled with cocaine, DHB, ecstasy, marijuana gummies, and Tucci, a pink drug that is a combination of ecstasy and cocaine. Child, and let me tell you something. When this thing dropped, when this thing dropped, I am telling you, let me let you see my face. I'm telling you right now, and I'm wearing pink for the pink cocaine. I had never in my life heard of pink cocaine. And that's not because I'm Pollyanna and naive. I've heard of all types of drugs. You have to remember, I'm a criminal defense attorney. I have clients that are charged with possession of various types of drugs, okay? And so throughout my career, I've heard of all types of drugs. I ain't never heard of no pink cocaine ever, ever in my life, okay? Never. 
And I was like, okay, this guy is making this up. And then I did some research. No, he's not. <laughs> he is not making it up. It is real. So we've got Walter White's Blue Meth and we got Pink Tucci. Well, Tucci, we got Pink Tucci out here. Who knew? This is really dangerous. Actually, this concerns me a lot because, you know, you know, uppers and accessing and things like that, they're not very good for your heart. And I'm not anti-drug, okay? But I'm anti-young people who are not fully informed taking drugs. And this looks too much like candy for me. And that really, really concerns me. I hope this does not get big on the streets. But you know, once it's mentioned, people are going to want to try it. And I'm really concerned about that. So according to Mr. Jones, defendant Coram wanted Mr. Combs' drug of choice immediately ready when he asked for it. According to Mr. Jones, defendant Coram ordered sex workers for Mr. Combs. On one occasion, she sent Mr. Jones a text message requesting he call a particular sex worker. We have the message. According to Mr. Jones, defendant, and again, that ain't got nothing to do with you, but it's salacious details that everyone is here to hear because they're so interested in this crazy lifestyle that Sean P. Diddy Combs lives. Here's my thing. If you are wealthy and you have the ability to access as many drugs as you want to your heart's content, I don't care. Honestly, I do not care. If you get to have sex with as many people as you want to, as to your heart's content, don't care. I do not care. My problem, my concern is when things are non-consensual. Are you administering drugs to people who don't want it? Are you having sex with people who don't want to have sex with you? Are you making people engage in sex work who do not want to engage in sex work? That is what my issue is. As long as everyone is consenting, and I know that everyone does not agree with that. Some people morally are against that type of lifestyle, but it's, I, I can recognize that something is not personally for me, but I am not morally against it as long as you're not hurting anyone. And what I don't understand about these allegations is if they are true, why, why would Diddy uh, uh, jeopardize his wealth, his diminished, but reputation, he has a reputation, his influence and his power, everything that he's built up over the course of almost 40 years, why would he jeopardize that by doing things with people non-consensually when he has the ability to find the people that are interested in the things that he's interested in and would really enjoy to take unlimited drugs and have unlimited sex and have sex with other people and, and uh, engage in sex work. There are people out there who willingly want to do those things. And so what I think to myself is someone who has all of the power and the control in their lives but still must seek out those who cannot resist them and still must subjugate and hurt people, there is something seriously wrong with them. I'm not saying Diddy is guilty. I do not know one way or the other. I am just saying that if these allegations are true, that is the, di that is the symptom of a sick mind, in my opinion, because he has everything at his disposal so that he can live out all of his fantasies consensually. And yet he is allegedly forcing people to engage in activities that they don't want to. However, what he is, Lil Rod, is detailing right here, these are, oop, I sh should stop messing with this uh, mic boom or whatever this is called. Um, but anyway, the, the what he is alleging right here is behavior from Diddy that in this particular part right here is consensual. So if it's consensual drugs, consensual sex, and it's not being put on you, I don't see how it's relevant to this particular lawsuit. So I always come back to that. How is it relevant? How does it help to advance the case? And on some of the charges, I see how things are relevant and how they advance the case, like the Cuba Gunning Jr. And then finally adding him as a, a defendant in the lawsuit. And then there's other allegations where I don't see at all how it's relevant. So let me pick this back up. According to Mr. Jones, on multiple occasions, defendant Coram forced him to carry up oh, Mr. <laughs> eat my words, forced him to carry Mr. Combs's drug pouch against his will. So he forced me to be a drug mule and I did not want to do that. Right. Because that's what you're doing when you and a lot of times these rich people will do that. They'll have the other people hold the drugs, hold the guns for them. I can't go down. I'm too important, but I'll pay your bail and I'll get you a great attorney. Your life will be ruined. Don't worry about it. But. Uh, my reputation will stay intact. So that's what he's saying. These pouches were always black and several of Mr. Combs' staff carried black Prada couches. Pa nope, black Prada pouches. According to Mr. Jones, defendant Coram also sent Mr. Jones to solicit sex workers for Mr. Combs. When the sex workers arrived at Mr. Combs' residence, defendant Coram would negotiate their price and would take them aside and pay them. 
Sean Combs's butler, Frankie, with the Black Prada pouch mentioned above while on the yacht from December 2022 to January 2023. So what he's trying to say is that this Black Prada pouch here on this guy's back right here is one of the signatures of his staff in which they would carry drugs for Diddy across state lines. Very, very, very interesting. So that's the butler, um, Frankie. As the chief of staff, defendant Corum was instrumental in organizing and executing the RICO and TVPA enterprises. So he is alleging that they are engaged in the RICO enterprise. Racketeering. Stevie J. Stevie J recruits sex workers and attends and participates in free golfs. Once again, here's the thing. Are the sex workers consenting? If they are, I personally don't care. But the law might care. The law enforcement might care if these things are illegal. It's only a limited amount of states in which prostitution is legal and only in designated areas in those states. So for the most part, in almost all states, almost all states, prostitution is illegal. And it is certainly illegal to take people across state lines for the purpose of prostitution. So that could be an issue uh, criminally. But that particular uh, point, bullet point A, um, is not an issue really in this lawsuit because it doesn't really impact this plaintiff. Justin Combs, the son of Sean Combs, um, solicits prostitutes, underage girls, and sex workers would engage in freak-offs. These freak-offs are what was alleged by Cassie in which she said that Sean Combs would hire male sex workers to have sex with her and he would watch and he was in particular interested in them being black male sex workers with large penises and that he would watch this happen. We're just talking real terms here, people, real terms. So please support because I'm not sugarcoating anything. I'm just every single day at work. I, I have to, you know, speak in plain language. It's really hard for me to then come here and speak in abbreviated terms. And this stuff is serious. And I think we should give it the seriousness it deserves. So. Brendan Paul works as Mr. Combs' mule. He acquires and distributes Mr. Combs' drugs and guns. Brendan Paul and Mr. Combs. This is Brendan Paul. This is Mr. Combs. Frankie Santella works alongside Brendan while Brendan acquires and distributes Mr. Combs' drugs and guns. Frankie carries the money and pays for the guns and drugs. I just want to say that um, syntax-wise, this entire sentence, oh, there is the freaking highlighter this entire sentence is poorly written all right this is not how you write a sentence in a lawsuit okay we have a video of mr combs stevie J, and plaintiff jones at a strip club mr combs is recording the video while coaching and training plaintiff jones how to recruit the sex worker see this is this is where i have skeptical space i'm i'm a bit skeptical here okay i'm a bit skeptical here okay and here is why. Mr. Jones, the plaintiff, Lil Rod, the musical prodigy, right, admits several times in this lawsuit to soliciting sex workers and says that, oh, it's just Diddy forcing me to do it. Then he sleeps with the sex workers. It's Diddy forcing me to engage in sex with the sex workers. And that to me, yes, guys, freak off. I, I think I explained the freak offs, right? Uh, I think I explained what the freak offs are as alleged by Cassie and now they're incorporated into this lawsuit. Right. And so I always had concerns that there was a little bit of regurgitating, taking what was in Cassie's lawsuit, co-opting the language into his own so that his attorney can make it seem more legitimate. However, there are parts of this where I'm like, nope, Diddy, you don't have the right to grope this guy. You don't have the right to touch this guy. But he is engaging in the exploitation of sex workers, if in fact that's what's happening. And he's saying, Diddy made me do it. The devil made me do it. And I said this on Twitter. I said this in the last, last live stream. I am skeptical about him voluntarily participating in these things, the possibility that he's voluntarily participating in these things, and yet saying that he is being forced to so that he can now have a claim against Diddy. But it's like when you were on the yachts and you were having fun, were you happy to take the drugs? Were you happy to have sex with the sex with the sex workers? I think what Lil Rod here is in is inadvertently doing is incriminating himself. And I think he is inadvertently exposed Diddy for 
potentially the creep that he is allegedly and exposed him to criminal prosecution. But I think that that sword could cut both ways because I'm not a hundred percent convinced that at the time that it was happening, he was not enjoying the spoils of Diddy's uh, plundering. Basically. Um, I think it looks to me like he was enjoying it at the time, but now that he's not getting paid, I was forced to have sex with these hot women. He forced me to have sex with these hot women, you know? And so I have a little bit of exactly Dr. Barry. If he had got the Grammy and the money, would he have sued? I don't think so. That's how I feel about it. You know, you didn't, I don't really think you cared how, you know, gay he was. That seems to be bothering a lot of people, how gay he was and pink drugs and, um, you know, girls taking you into the bathroom and sucking you off. None of that was bothering you until you didn't get paid. That's how it came across to me. However, if Diddy did grope him against his will, if Cuba Gooding Jr. did grope him against his will, if he was assaulted, if he was threatened by Diddy, then I definitely think he has a claim. I just wish that the lawsuit was brought down to that because those things are diminished by the salaciousness of these details in which he admits to participating in criminal activity. All right. Okay, so we have a video of Mr. Combs, Stevie J, and Plaintiff Jones in a strip club. We've already talked about that. Vice President of Music Management and Strategic Partnerships. Vice President of Music Management and Combs Global. I guess he's saying who that person was. Okay, Frankie Santella and Sean Combs. Here they are together. It's interesting. He has so many photographs of Sean P. Diddy Combs, but not many photographs of him committing crimes, which is very, very interesting. And I want you guys to know, I am no defender of Sean P. Diddy Combs. I am not. His shady biz business practices, I, you know, I completely believe all of his victims of his business mismanagement and grift. I believe them. I believe uh, the female victims who he settled with, I believe them. And I think that the court will deal with the ones he has not settled with and we'll see what happens there. So it's not a outside the realm of possibility that he did all of these things. I just think I see another opportunist in the mix. And to me, it is the plaintiff. Moy Bond hires sex workers, attends and participates in freak offs. I don't know what these dogs are doing. I want to let you guys know I've got two, I've got two dogs and a cat and a husband. <laughs> and uh, Jazz and uh, DJ are my dogs. And my cat, our cat, our dog. Our cat is Susie. Susie is 20 years old. DJ is four. Jazz is over a year. She's like 18 months now, right? Not even that old. 14 months. So she's a year. And Jazz has been wanting someone to play with because Susie does not want to play with her because Susie is an old lady and she's she's a queen. She doesn't want to play rough. DJ was in his shell when we first got him and he has now come out of his shell and he's a little chihuahua uh mix with like cocker spaniel and him and jazz is a border collie so she's much bigger than him and they go at it every single day they've got the zoomies ever since dj like came out of his shell they get the zoomies together they turn up and it makes me so so happy maybe i'll be able to show you guys the video at the end of the stream but if you hear any little rum, 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 that's them like running around and playing with each other they're having so much fun no dogs are being injured they are having a good time trust me and they don't like it when we separate them so they're they're becoming a, a, like a bonded pair they're very very happy together okay so this is Moy Bon. He hires sex workers and attends and participates in freak offs, allegedly. Moy Bon, Thanksgiving 2022, when Mr. Combs offered Mr. Jones cocaine. Okay, here's the thing. He offered you cocaine. Is that something to sue for? I don't know. I don't know if offering someone cocaine or coming onto them sexually is enough to sue. Touching you against your will after you say no, that is enough. Forcing you to take drugs, that is certainly enough. But just saying, hey, you want some of this cocaine? We're all having a party. Is that something to sue for? Uh, let's think of it as, as wine. Maybe you're recovering our alcoholic. You're at an event and someone offers you alcohol. That might be offensive to you, but is that something to sue for? If someone tries to pour the alcohol down your throat, we're assaulting you now. So clearly that's something to sue for. So that's, that's kind of like what some of my issues are. According to Mr. Jones, Mr. Com Combs funded and used his affiliation with local gangs and gang leaders. Let's look at this thumbnail. Plaintiff has intentionally left the names and images of these individuals out of the pleadings, out of fear of retaliation, fear of retaliation. He will provide the information to the court under seal or in camera. So under seal just means, hey, look, 
there is the possibility that if I were to tell you about this, I could be harmed. And so I don't want this to be for public consumption, but I do have evidence to back this up. And this is just the initial pleading. It doesn't, it's not discovery. It does not have to have all the evidence. In fact, this, this filing has way more evidence than a lawsuit should have way more evidence than a lawsuit should have. It's just ridiculous. Right. And so it's okay. That's totally fine to say, I don't want to give you that information right now, but upon information and belief, what my client tells me, what I believe based on my client has told what my client has told me, these facts have occurred. Um, these gang leaders would frequent his homes in LA and Miami to secure the drugs and guns. And what homes got raided? The homes in LA and Miami. I wonder if Diddy still has his house in the Hamptons. He used to have a house in the Hamptons. But um, and that's where he used to throw his white parties when I was living in New York. That was like a big thing, like the Diddy white party. Everybody knew when that was happening. None of us had any access to it whatsoever. But like, you know, the old school online blogs would always post how people would dress and stuff. So his, I don't know if he still has that home, but the L.A. and Miami homes are mentioned here. And that's what gets raided by the feds to secure the drugs and guns he obtained and distributed out of his homes in L.A. and Miami. According to Mr. Jones, defendants executed their RICO and TVPA enterprises with threats of violence, threatening. OK, so here we go. This should not be in bullet point number 187 and page number 39 of a lawsuit that someone threatened to eat your face. That threat is actionable. You know, threats, harassment, assault, all of those things are actionable. You can sue for those things. And it, you don't get until page 187. We have to wade through all these allegations about gay sex between consensual adults or sex with sex workers where you're not showing that these sex workers are being told to do anything against their will or you're alleging that they were trafficking uh, across state lines, but you're saying you participated in that trafficking. Finally, this is something where you are a plaintiff, this and Cuba Gooding Jr., and it takes page 100, I mean, bullet point 187 for you to get there. There used to be this law firm that I worked for, and the supervisor, the supervising attorney was extremely tough, and but I learned something from him, and one of those things was do not bury your most important uh, fact in your lawsuit, in your claim, in your, in your brief, in your motion, all the way in the middle or down at the bottom. Everyone is lost by then. No one's paying any attention. Bullet point 187, come on. This is bad lawyering. Anyway, defendants executed their RICO and TVPA enterprises with threats of violence, threatening to eat plaintiff's face, displaying and distributing guns in plaintiff's presence, bragging about having law enforcement under control, bragging about murdering people, bragging about bribing witnesses and jurors in the criminal case. So this could be, a judge could find this part to be relevant, right? Oh, uh, so he bragged about, bribing witnesses and jurors in the criminal case concerning the 1999 New York City nightclub shooting with Shine. So there was this rapper named Shine. Um, he was like this like slim, light-skinned guy. I think he's now a Hasidic Jew, and I think he's from Belize. Anyway, he was a slim, light-skinned guy, and he rapped like Biggie. And um, he had this like kind of like one-hit wonder type song. He was under Diddy, uh, under Bad Boy Records, Puff Daddy, whatever. And there was a nightclub shooting in which Diddy was involved, but Shine took the rap. Um, and they said that Shine was the shooter. And there's always been questions about whether or not Shine was actually the shooter. Shine got deported as a result of it. I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure he and Diddy have mended fences recently. But I know he was angry with Diddy because they said essentially he went down for Diddy. Um, and so they're saying that Diddy paid off jurors in the criminal case. He bribed witnesses. Now, I don't know why he would have done that if Shine was actually convicted. Do you want him to be convicted? I don't know. But anyway, that is not a rumor that is that is new to Mr. Jones. That is something I've heard before in the, you know, gossip streets. Right. I am not an informed person. I don't know any of these celebrities. Thank God. I don't know any of these people. But I'm just saying that this allegation that's what he's talking about shine is that rapper who took a charge of in a nightclub shooting for, for diddy it was diddy was a suspect but shine was convicted okay and so i could see a judge saying that if you're saying that he threatened you threatened to eat your face uh assaulted you hit you whatever the case may be sexually harassed you right because that's uh, that's what he's alleging sexual harassment from diddy right 
then you could say that this stuff would become relevant because if he brags about it, he uses it as a position of control so that he can get what he wants out of Lil Rod. So while it's not directly on point to what Rod is talking about, it is relevant to whether or not Rod felt threatened based on Diddy's control over the police bragging about murdering people. Let's not let that pass us by bragging about murdering people. I mean, goodness gracious bragging about murdering people. You know, one would be afraid if you're bragging about murdering people in front of them. So you'll see in this, my analysis of this lawsuit, I'll kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And that's just because I'm looking at the case fairly. There are some good points that Lil Rod makes. There are some stupid points that Lil Rod's attor attorney, Lil Rod's attorney makes. And this is actually good points right here. According to Mr. Jones, that's Lil Rod, defendants executed his RICO and TVPA enterprise with threats of isolation from the music and entertainment industry. Grow some balls. Grow some balls on that one. Sorry. Threats of isolation from the music industry. That's how the music industry works. Word of mouth. That's how most industries work. Word of mouth. And so you can get blackballed from entertainment, acting, music, social media, all those types of things. So I don't really know if you can really sue about that. But anyway, moving on. Parading powerful music industry and in executives at his parties. That's not actionable. Okay. So saying like, if you do me wrong, you'll never work in the city again. That is not actionable. That is just not actionable. <laughs> that is the reality of the music industry. You'll never work in this town again. That's, that's an old school phrase where people would get blackballed out of the industry and he had the power to do it. Okay. Now, if it's, if you don't have sex with me, you'll never work in this town again. That could be extortion. That could be sexual harassment. You know, those types of things, but that's not really how he's putting it. Parading your powerful music industry executives is inherently an innocent and innocuous thing to do because he is a powerful music executive. His friends are going to be powerful music executives. When he goes places, they will be there as well. So he's not parading them in front of you to get you to do anything. So that's kind of silly. Filled with sex workers and illegal drugs. Once again, you're having sex with the sex workers according to your own statement, which concerns me. I don't know if I would get into this. Like, this is going to get him in trouble with the feds for sure. This is going to get Diddy, was, that's what I mean, Diddy in trouble with the feds for sure, but potentially exposes the client to liability. Will the feds be wanting to go after Mr. Jones, Lil Rob, Mr. Jones, um, when he is an alleged victim in a lawsuit? Maybe not, but maybe they will because he's admitting to procuring sex workers, procuring drugs, being a drug mule, he's admitting to all of these things in this lawsuit and just saying, did he made me do it? Did he force me to do it? I wasn't otherwise inclined, but until I wanted that money, did he made me do it? So he had these parties that were filled with sex workers, illegal drugs, ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms, and the pink cocaine. According to Mr. Jones, defendant Combs executed his RICO and TVPA enterprises with threats of non-payment for work completed, Fake promises of cash payments. I want to see some. I want to see some evidence of the promise for that cash payment. Producer of the year Grammy awards. He cannot promise you that. But this thing is that, like, even if he promised, okay, I'll put it to you this way, okay. What he's alleging here is essentially breach of contract. We're still in the facts. We're not even at the claims of damages that he's even saying. But he, but these all go to essentially a breach of contract. He said that if I produce these songs for me, for him, he would pay me $250,000 a song or $20,000 a song, whatever the case may be, $20,000 a song, and he would get me a Grammy, okay? All right, say I'm a baker, okay? And I start baking for Gordon Ramsay. Uh, I become one of his sous chef bakers. I don't know. I start baking for Gordon Ramsay. And Gordon Ramsay says, for every amount of uh, baked goods that you sell, I'm going to give you this amount of money. And then he doesn't do it. I can sue him for that. But then he says, for every amount of baked goods that you sell, I'm going to get you, uh, I'm going to make sure that you win the best British bake off or the best American bake off. He cannot promise me that and so since it's something he cannot promise me he doesn't own the best american bake-off right he doesn't 
he's not one of the judges. He's not one of the producers. It's they've got their set of judges. You know what I'm saying? And so he can't guarantee me that because he's not in control of that enterprise. There's no court that could enforce the fact that I didn't win the best American Bake Off because I was working for Gordon Ramsay. And he promised that to me. If I promise, I'll give you the moon if you mow my, my backyard. That is not something that's enforceable in court. It just means that you were naive and gullible to believe that I could give you the moon in exchange for you mowing my backyard. That's kind of what this is like. So just because he was naive enough to believe that he would get a Grammy and maybe if this did happen, Diddy is an asshole and, um, and, and a mean person for lying to this guy and telling him, I'll get you a Grammy if you become a producer on my album. It doesn't mean that it's actionable in a court of law. They cannot force him to give you a Grammy. That can't be one of your remedies because Diddy is not in control of the Grammys. <laughs> okay. But what he is in control of is access to future projects, a which we won't get now, a $20 million home on Star Island in Miami. This, aside from the Grammy, guys, this allegation is the silliest to me. Aside from the Grammy, I think the Grammy is the most silliest. This is the second silliest as far as like, he promised me these things. He breached the contract in this way. Okay. And here's why. Diddy has kids, women, relatives, his mom that he, I know he takes care of and stuff like that. He's got friends. And here you are, some music producer that he just met this year or, you know, whatever year you start working on the album for him, right? That he just meets you and he's going to give you a $20 million home on Star Island in Miami. That is, if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. You're complete. You're so gullible if you believe that. And where is there a contract saying, and, and that's not even something that you put in a contract for a music production. You produce these songs for me, I'm going to give you a mansion. That's No, no, that's not what happens. That's silly. There's a pink tax on the pink cocaine is hilarious. <laughs> Please stop being so funny. That is so hilarious. Now, if you have a contract that say, says he's going to give you a $20 million home on Star Island, I will eat my words. And I've done that in this live stream already. I will eat my words, but I just don't believe that. I'm credulous. I'm incredulous. I'm incredulous. You were credulous for believing that. Mr. Combs is allowed to wreak havoc. Let's get into it. While living and traveling with Mr. Combs, Mr. Jones discovered that Mr. Combs had hidden cameras in every room of his home. Mr. Jones believes that Mr. Combs has recordings of several celebrities, artists, music label executives, and athletes engaging in illegal activity at Mr. Combs' functions. He's like, hey, feds, hey, <clears throat> excuse me, government, excuse me, uh, Sean Diddy Combs is uh, committing crimes in his house and it's all on tape. Go get the tape. And the feds are like, bet, we're going to go get the tape. See that whole little thing I just said there, Devin? Hey, girl, if you could make that into a short because that just, that was bars. That was bars just now. He literally was like, excuse me, federal government, Diddy is committing crimes in his house and it's on tape. Go get the tape. And the feds were like, we got you. That's exactly what we're going to do. And that's what they did. Does that mean that it advances the lawsuit of Mr. Jones? No, but it does mean that Mr. Combs is going to have his money spread really, really thin, fighting all these lawsuits and now this federal case. Upon information and belief, this is bad. And again, it is bad. There's a lot of things that he alleges here. Where I'm ob objectively saying it's not even a subjective thing it's objectively terrible right terrible things to do not actionable in this civil case but now we're getting all the tea apparently so this is what it is and i think a lot of this is so that we'll tune in and we'll read the whole lawsuit because there's a lot of salacious details of the inner workings of hollywood but less to do with an actual actionable claim these individuals were recorded without their knowledge and consent as is the case with the homosexual sex tape that Mr. K Combs provided to Mr. Jones claiming to be Stevie J, which we now know was not. Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage. See, ah, all right, finish the sentence. Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage of every person who has attended his freak off parties 
and his house parties. Here's the issue that I have with this. You're like, just like the Stevie J tape, he has tapes of people having sex in his house parties in compromising positions. But the Stevie J tape is not real. So how do we know that any of the other tapes are real? And what is your basis of knowledge for this? Upon information and belief, so we don't know how, my client tells me so and so I believe it and so I'm putting it in this lawsuit. Due to this treasure trove of evidence he has in his possession, Ms. Mr. Combs believes that he is above the law and untouchable. That's scary. Based on information and belief, Mr. Combs employs Jose Cruz as his IT director. Oh, poor Jose. <laughs> Jose, just make sure the computers don't get overheated. And here he is in this lawsuit. This writer has spoken to several former employees of Mr. Combs who confirmed that Jose Cruz is the gatekeeper to all of Mr. Combs. There weren't many spelling mistakes in this, so I'm not going to be mean. Mr. Combs' recordings. Upon information and belief, Jose Cruz intentionally hides behind the camera and from social media and the internet due to all the incriminating acts he was required to record for Combs. If the incriminating acts are not known to the general public, maybe the guy just does not like social media. That's kind of silly. I guess he's showing that he has the guy's Puffs Tech guy, Cali. Like he just has his information. Defendant. <laughs> okay, move on. Defendant Mr. Combs hired private investigator Russell L. Green to seek out, harass, and bribe individuals to provide dirt on Mr. Jones. Ooh, dig into this. On or about March 2nd, 2024. Uh huh. So, you know, like compromise, you're trying to find some compromising information on the plaintiff to try to get him to withdraw the lawsuit or to settle. Interesting. Mr. Jones was informed by a close friend from his church that Mr. Combs and engineer, engineer Matt Testa provided an individual's phone number to Los Angeles based investigator Russell L. Green. It's Russell Green. Gave me your number. Are you available to speak with me? Hey, I can chat in a couple of hours if that's cool. Sounds good. I'm at an event from three to five, so I'll be able I'll be available after five. I'm on the West Coast. Where are you? I'm in Los Angeles. I can talk at 1.30 as well. Okay, you available now to just call me? Yes. Upon information belief, Mr. Green attempted to bribe this anonymous individual with an uncertain amount of money in exchange for her producing text messages or any evidence that this individual could provide to paint Mr. Jones in a bad light. Mr. Jones has good friends. Because a lot of people would have taken that money and that stuff would have been plastered all over the news by now. During a call with Mr. Jones, this individual expressed fear for their safety and the safety of their family. This is a clear example of some of the tactics implemented by Combs and the members of Combs RICO and TVPA Enterprise. Besides contacting the individual previously mentioned, Mr. Green contacted Mr. Jones' eight-year-old daughter. Oh, no, that is not okay. So this lawsuit gets filed and now... Uh, private investigator who was allegedly hired by Sean P. Diddy Combs contacts his friend, Mr. Jones's friend, and also Mr. Jones's child. Not okay. He solicited information from this child about her father until she cried in fear and handed the phone to her mother. At that time, her mother hung up the phone. Mr. Green proceeded to text her. She informed him that she did not want to be bothered, and he continued to send her unwanted, harassing text messages i want to see those text messages i want to see those text messages because i don't like that leave the babies out of this first cause of action conduct and participate in a rico enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity in violation of the rico act mr jones incorporates all of the above allegations so he's saying that basically i'm suing him because he's violating rico and i don't know what standing he has to sue one private citizen has to sue another private citizen for committing RICO crimes. But um, I'm going to look at that uh, because I have uh, some doubts. Let's just put it that way. I have some doubts. I'm going to look at that. Uh, I'll keep reading. Oh, child. Oh, what you doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess you're not going to do that for me. Um, so let me just do it myself. 18 U.S.C. 1962 is the RICO statute. 1962. So this is the RICO statute. Um, all right, let's let's see this. 
prohibited activities, but this looks like a criminal statute. Okay, let me let me show it to you guys. Um, they are turning up out there. They are so silly. Okay, guys. They're having such a good time. You have no idea. Okay. It shall be unlawful for any person. And my and also, just so you know, the children are not unsupervised. My husband is downstairs. So don't worry. <laughs> it shall be unlawful for any person who has received any income derived directly or indirectly from a pattern of racketeering activity or through collection of an unlawful debt in which such person has participated as a principal with the, within the meaning of this to invest directly or indirectly any part of such income or the proceeds of such income in acquisition of a RICO enterprise, a purchase, a purchase of, okay, so it's unlawful to do a RICO. It shall be unlawful through a pattern of racketeering or through collection of unlawful debt to acquire or maintain directly or indirectly any interest in or control of any enterprise, which engages with, or the activities of which affect interstate or foreign commerce. So you can't do racketeering activity and affect interstate commerce. That means business from one state to the other, which um, sex trafficking is. It shall be unlawful for any person employed by or associated with the enterprise uh, engaged in or the activities of which affect interstate or foreign commerce to conduct or participate directly or indirectly in the conduct of such enterprises affairs through a pattern of racketeering activity or collection of unlawful debt. It shall be unlawful for any person to conspire to violate any of the provisions of this. So these are crimes, right? This is a crime. So I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if um, any of my lawyer friends are in here. I know that Kurt was in here earlier. If uncivil law, if you're in here, can you drop a note on how it is that he can sue for the crime of RICO? What is his standing as a private citizen to sue someone else for committing the crime of racketeering? Please let me know, okay? Um, because I, I don't see it. I'm kind of confused by it. Uh, I wouldn't say kind of confused. I just, I have doubts. But someone might know better than I because I am not a civil attorney. I'm a criminal attorney. And I don't see, these are crimes that should be prosecuted criminally. And it looks like they may be, okay? Um, oops, I shared the wrong screen. Hold on. <laughs> oh my God. Guys, chill. <laughs> yeah, they've got the zoomies. Okay, so Rico. Defendant Lucian Charles Grange, that was the um, Caucasian man that you saw the picture of at the beginning of the stream, in his capacity as CEO of UMG, Motown Records, Universal Music Group, is 100% liable for the actions of Sean Combs, Love Records, Combs Global, Justin Combs, and Christina Corum. Let's say something about Christina Corum. One second. Christina Corum actually, I think, is providing information to Lil Rod. Let me see. I got a letter. Let me show it to you guys. Hold on. Okay. Show and find her. Okie dokie. Let me show you guys this. Okay, this is a letter that um, Jones's attorney, you might not be able to see it well, there we go. This is a letter that Jones's attorney wrote to, um, to the court, letting them know that someone is participating and providing information to Jones. This is dated March 23rd of 2024. So I thought this would be interesting for you guys to see. T.A. Blackburn Law. Tyrone Blackburn is the attorney for Mr. Um, Jones. And I might have to eat, like I said, eat my words on this lawsuit because I think there's a lot of irrelevant things in there, but they, you separate the wheat from the chaff. There may be something there that's actionable, um, in particular, the allegations of harassment and sexual assault. Um, dear Judge Oatkin, so I guess the case has now been assigned to Judge Oatkin. 
um, or Otkin. I am writing to provide your honor with an update regarding the above reference matter, which is Jones v. Combs. On behalf of the plaintiff Jones, on March 21st, 2024, plaintiff entered into an agreement with defendant Ethiopia Habertamarium. So she was one of the named defendants in the first complaint. This complaint has now been amended. So in the first complaint, she was one of the named defendants. Under this agreement, in exchange for a declaration that will be appended to the forthcoming amended complaint, the plaintiff has agreed to dismiss all claims against Habertamarium with prejudice, which means she has been, if you go back to that previous live stream in which we talked about this lawsuit, she was one of the defendants. She has been dismissed and they have agreed to never bring it back against her, right? They will not file another claim against her. It is with prejudice. Furthermore, which makes me think Habertamarium is, which is, that's the Ethiopian last name, I think. Habertamarium is participating or has given them some type of information for them to have agreed not to proceed on a case against her. Furthermore, the plaintiff has elected to dismiss the claims against Chalice Recording Studio, CRS, without prejudice, meaning that we could bring it back against them. This decision enables the plaintiff to refile these claims in Los Angeles, California, where CRS is headquartered. So basically, I guess CRS got in contact with Blackburn and was like, excuse me, I am not headquartered in New York. Um, this company isn't in New York. We're solely in California. You cannot sue us here. So interesting. These dismissals are uh, made pursuant to federal rules of civil procedure 41A1. AI of the federal rules of civil procedure. Although they have been in constant contact with this writer through threatening emails and letters, the remaining defendants have yet to appear in the case, meaning that they have not had any attorneys file their appearance in the case. Instead, defendant Sean Combs, through his representatives, has engaged in concerning behavior, including manufacturing stories about plaintiff. I have never seen this type of letter addressed to a judge. Never, ever, 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 ever. Other attorneys, you tell me, have you seen this before? I've never seen this before. Let's finish this off. Woo! Okay. Woo! That's good. <laughs> that is dry. That is not sweet. And that's how I like it. I like it dry. So... Um, he's like, listen, Diddy is talking to TMZ. He's dispatching his agents to harass the plaintiff's eight-year-old daughter, the mother of his child, and ex-spouses. How many ex-spouses does he have? All of whom have expressed fear of potential harm by defendant Combs. Moreover, defendant Sean Combs has attempted to contact plaintiff through third parties to persuade plaintiff to terminate this writer and hire counsel who has a relationship with, and I don't have the rest of it, okay? So basically, he's like, judge, we're dropping the charges against Ethiopia We're with prejudice, so we're never going to bring it back. We're dropping the charges against CR CRS because we filed it in the wrong jurisdiction. We need to uh, charge them or uh, file the claim in California where they are. And Sean P. Diddy Combs is now harassing the plaintiff instead of actually having an attorney enter their appearance in the case, which is fascinating fascinating okay let's keep this going we're gonna pick right back up with the lawsuit what did i do oh no here it is it's all good share nope let me see okay good we're good we're good okay i can close this the collective financially benefited from defendants Sean Combs, Combs Enterprise, Love Records, Justin Combs, Christina Corum, through their partnership and distribution deal with Sean Combs and Love Records. The collective provided defendants Sean Combs, Combs Enterprises, Love Records, Justin Combs, and Christina Corum with unfettered access to financial resources in the form of wire transfers, direct payments, and invoice reimbursements, and failed to adequately investigate, supervise, and or monitor where the money was being used, who was using the money, and what the money was being used for. Interesting, because, you know, the Universal Music Group, which I guess has some type of stake or ownership in, um, you know, Diddy's businesses, um, what did they know? And what should they have known? 
And did they fail to exercise duties and therefore torts were committed? That's really what the question is. The issue is here. If they knew nothing, if they if they followed all the normal business practices um, in the music industry and yet Puffy still engaged in these crimes, they would not be liable, I don't think. But if they had a certain supervisory role, which they failed to um, execute, then they could be liable. So that this is a very, very interesting because this person is a rung above Sean P. Diddy Combs. The financial support provided by the collective was the lifeline that spearheaded and maintained defendants Combs, Inter Combs Enterprise, Love Records, Justin Combs, and Christina Corms' depraved actions. Once again, that's a value judgment that I'm not interested in getting in. I don't care if Combs is gay. I don't care if he takes drugs. I don't care if he likes to have sex with prostitutes. I care about consent and paying people what you promise to pay them. And that's what this is all about. Did he violate people without their consent? Did he violate Jones, because this is who the plaintiff is, without his consent? And did he fail to pay Jones according to their contract? That would be borne out in the case itself. Well, the writer's camp at CRS, the nightly club love parties at CRS, and the yacht were all spaces that defendants Combs Combs Enterprise, Love Records, Justin Combs, and Christina Corum utilized to produce songs that were released on the Love Album. The Love Album related expenses reimbursement requirements was a ruse. The collective knew or should have known that defendants Combs, so on and so forth, had no intention to utilize the collective's financial support for album related expenses. How would they know that? I feel like record companies pay people with the expectation that they'll work on the albums that they're paying them for. That's very, very strange. Why? Like you're just, that's a conclusory statement. I would like to see some other claims here have been backed up with because of these facts. This is why we believe this conclusion, but I see no facts to support this particular conclusion. The collective's willful blindness resulted in Jones suffering the harm detailed herein. I want to know what the harm is. What is the harm and what is the harm to you? I really want you to be more specific about that. Um, okay, so so the statute says that um, any act or threat involving murder, kidnapping, gambling, arson, robbery, bribery, extortion, dealing in obscene manner, dealing in a controlled substance or listed chemical, which is chargeable under state law and punishable by imprisonment of more than one year, any act which is indictable under any of the following provisions, Relating to trafficking of firearms, which he has accused Diddy of doing. Relating to the obstruction of state or local law, which he has accused Diddy of doing, paying off cops. Relating to peonage, slavery, and trafficking in persons, which he has accused Diddy of doing in trafficking sex workers. Um, and then relating to racketeering. So he's basically saying that by providing financial support for Diddy, they supported the racketeering enterprise. But how do they know that? Right. How do they know that? How do you know that they knew that? I would like to see some information on that. I haven't seen that yet. OK. So we all know these things are unlawful, unlawful, unlawful. But that means to me that the federal government is the correct prosecuting body and not this plaintiff in a civil case. I hope that makes sense. What I'm trying to say is basically you. I have doubts that he can sue for racketeering because that's a crime that's prosecuted by the government okay that's what i'm trying to say and it looks like the government is prosecuting it again the government was like say no more defendants have unlawfully increased their profits by luring and deceiving producers musicians writers creators and artists such as plaintiff to their organization for the misstated purpose of using their talents as creatives to produce music Defendants' true intentions are later revealed through a calculated grooming scheme that includes false promises of business opportunities, exposure to music executives with the promise of future introductions. But you just said that he flaunted the business executives in front of you, so he is exposing you to them. And the promise of awards and accolades, which he cannot promise, which quickly, I mean, he may promise them, but that's not something that's actionable because he cannot provide that to you, which quickly shifts to unauthorized drugging, threats of bodily harm, sex trafficking, and sleep deprivation. According to Mr. Jones, defendant Combs often required Mr. Jones to work for several consecutive days without sleep. That's abuse. That's abuse. According to Mr. Jones, it was imperative to always look like he was working whenever Mr. Combs walked by. 
well, I don't want sleep deprivation of any employee of mine, but if I have an employee around me, I want you to look like you're working too. So I no longer supervise people, thank goodness, but I have supervised people and I don't want people to like they're lounging. I want you to look you're working. So please don't sue me. Within a few months of working for and living with Mr. Combs, Mr. Jones witnessed KK instruct her direct reports and Combs Enterprise employees, Brendan, Frankie, and Moy to acquire and transport the following drugs. Ecstasy, cocaine, GMB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms. Okay. Mr. Jones personally witnessed Combs Enterprise employee Brendan transport firearms to and from nightclubs, strip clubs. Again, that has nothing to do with you. This is for the federal government to prosecute, which it looks like they're doing. And again, it just may be that he puts these things in the lawsuit to make sure that this guy gets federally prosecuted. That's what this really looks like. A lot of this looks like, you know, hello, police, <laughs> police. <laughs> Help. <laughs> okay. Mr. Jones personally witnessed Mr. Combs distribute firearms out of his bedroom closet to individuals that Mr. Jones knew to be members of local gangs. Wow. Okay. And once again, not something that's actionable because that's, that doesn't harm Mr. Jones in any way, but may later on form the basis of a criminal prosecution. Plaintiff is intentionally being vague and fear for his personal safety. He can provide more detail to the court in camera. That means in the court's chambers outside of the public view. During the making of the Love album, several evenings, Mr. Jones personally witnessed Mr. Combs instruct the Combs Enterprise employees, Brendan, Frankie, and Moy to solicit sex workers to the recording studio at his homes and to the Chalice Recording Studios. According to Mr. Jones, Mr. Combs felt there was too much testosterone in the studio and wanted sex workers there to create the vibe for the Love album. Okay, all right. Then these workers arrive and Mr. Jones and other musicians and producers were required to engage in sex acts with them. This, okay, I'm just saying that this part where you engage in sex acts with sex workers is going to be difficult at the trial because Diddy's attorneys are just going to say, that's what you wanted to do. You wanted to have sex with these sexy women that were brought to the studio. Unfortunately, hip hop is extremely misogynistic. And a part of hip hop recording culture is having these hot girls in the studio and stuff like that. If one of them were suing and like, I was assaulted, I was raped, this thing happened to me as a result, then I would be like, okay, my ears would perk up. Let me hear what's happened here. But what he's saying is you, you had sex with these women that may potentially be victims. And now you're saying that you're a victim. I don't quite understand that. And that may be sexism on my part. Right. That may be sexism on my part. I'm trying to unpack that. But as on a legal basis, if I was in front of the jury and I was Sean P. Diddy Combs attorney, I'm going to say you were willfully having sex with these women. And when you didn't get the mansion and the Grammy and the millions of dollars, now you want to sue and say you were forced to have sex with sex workers. I don't know. KK and Frankie would often negotiate the price for their services. They would either pay the workers in cash electronically or through any other form requested by the sex worker. Everyone's accounts are getting raided. Everyone's accounts. These The feds are going to dig all up in this. And if it looks like any of these girls were women were underage, not consenting or having sex in states in which it was illegal, they are going down as detailed in the chart below. But Mr. Jones was groomed into soliciting. That's not what grooming is. That's not what that's not what grooming is. Groomed into soliciting um, sex workers for Mr. Combs. He often negotiated the cost via text message. See, this is what I'm trying to say. Mr. Jones is essentially holding himself out to be a pimp in his actions. He's telling you that inside I was against it. I'm a church boy. I'm a musical genius. I learned music in school. I play multiple instruments. I'm a good guy. But yet and still you're using Cash App and PayPal and Venmo to pay sex workers, go and pick them up and bring them to the studio. You are a sex trafficker too. That is what's really concerning to me. It's me and Mr. Jones, me and Mr. Jones. What kind of fuckery is this? 
No, seriously, this is bullshit. I'm, I'm, th there's certain parts of this where I'm like, this is bullshit. There's other parts of this where it's like, Diddy is going to prison because these are crimes. And there's other parts of this where I'm like, okay, this is an actual civil action that Mr. Jones could proceed with against Sean P. Diddy Combs. There's too much here in this 98 page complaint. It was really 70 something pages. Now it's 98 pages. That's crazy. Okay. The RICO enterprise, which all defendants have engaged in and the activities of which affected interstate and foreign commerce is compromised is comprised of an association, in fact, of persons, including each defendant and other unnamed co-conspirators. That association was structured by various general partnership agreements. So he's like, OK, all these people came together to agree to do this stuff. Right. Um, by which defendants assume different roles in either knowingly or negligently funding directly or indirectly participating in the acts necessary to carry out a scheme to acquire and distribute drugs, firearms, prostitutes, and sex workers, which you say that you helped him to carry across state lines, sex workers, and drugs. So mm, you're implicating yourself. As detailed herein, Plaintiff Jones Mr. Jones <laughs> worked for Mr. Combs for 13 months. Combs Enterprise employee Frankie um, solicited him to produce the Love album. We already know that. Frankie and Combs agreed to provide Jones $20,000 per song, four royalty points per song, credits as a producer, credit for each instrument. I want to see a contract for that, for the Love album. Over 13 months, Jones fulfilled his end of the agreement. This is, this is breach of contract and provided services for the love album. Mr. Combs benefited from his services and refused to compensate him by their agreement. If proven to be true, this is a tort. Breach of contract. This is a tort. I did the work. You didn't pay me according to our agreement. Jones is not the only creative who has had his services stolen by Mr. Combs. True. Many creatives worked for months on the love album and were never compensated for their work. Well, I don't know about the love album in particular, but there are plenty of artists like Danny Kane, Mace, all types of people who have come forward and said that Diddy essentially ripped them off. According to the Habert Merriam declaration, that's the one who, so she made a declaration in the case and she's been dropped by the case, dropped from the case. So I really want to see that. The collective reimbursed or paid for the production of the Love album. Mr. Jones was not compensated. So if the Habits and Miriam Declaration is correct, what was the collective financial support used for? It could have been just Diddy. I don't know. And what mechanism did the collective have in place to ensure the money provided to defendants, Sean Combs and so forth, were used for the purpose outlined in the collective's partnership deal with defendants Combs, Combs Enterprise, and Love Records? So basically, Haber to Miriam must work for the collective. And she's like, we paid. He didn't pay you, but we paid him. We are not liable. And she's gone. The collective and defendants, so on and so forth, all share a common purpose to use deception, coercion, force, and the threat of violence to enrich themselves at the expense of individuals like the plaintiff. As set forth herein, and I want to say on the threat of violence thing, it has been said by Cassie and admitted by Kid Cudi that when Diddy and Cassie uh, temporarily broke up, and she, um, you know, started dating Kid Cudi that Diddy blew up Kid Cudi's car. And then Kid Cudi made that um, his album cover, a picture of his car engulfed in flames. Um, so, you know, the threats of violence are not unheard of outside of this lawsuit. OK. All right, so he's going to say a bunch of stuff. Upon information and belief, the collective and defendants, Combs, Combs Enterprise, Love Records, just so on and so forth, had several partnerships throughout the years. Defendant UMG provided Combs with unfettered access to financial dollars in exchange for Mr. Combs and defendants, so on and so forth, providing defendant UMG with the fruits of the labor of producers, musicians, writers, and creators, and artists such as plaintiffs to utilize their talents and labor to produce music and other tangible goods and services without full compensation. Basically, they have been paying Diddy, knowing that Diddy is not paying the people that he is contracting, right? How dare you make me a pimp, Diddy? How dare you make me a pimp? <laughs> That's essentially what that is. Okay. So date of partnership. What is all this? This doesn't have anything to do with you. So, okay. Oh, I see. I see. I see. So he's saying that this is when these co companies were in partnership with one another. How long those apart, those partnerships went on for as outlined in the chart above 
Defendants Comb and then CEO and owner of Bad Boy Records entered a joint venture deal with Universal Music, a subsidiary of Defendant Universal Music Group. Upon information and belief, at the time Defendant Combs and UMG entered their three-year joint venture, it was public knowledge that Combs had a serious reputation for violence and engaging in criminal activity. So basically, they should not have contracted with him and that by doing so, they provided him with the funds and the resources to be able to commit his crimes and thereby um, commit a tort against the plaintiff. That's what they're saying here. And we're going to skip. This is very, very technical, but that's essentially what they're saying here is that they they had the financial assets to fund Diddy and Diddy use that money to commit crimes and torts. And so they are on the hook for paying this monster. Whereas they're just saying we paid him to produce music. The music was produced and we don't have anything to do with what he does with that music. Think about it also this way. You have a legitimate job, but you take that money from your legitimate job to go and commit crimes. Is your legitimate job on the hook or responsible for the crimes that you committed? Do they have a duty to supervise you outside of work or a duty to supervise you in the course of your duties to make sure that you're not committing a crime? That is a question I think that's going to be determined in court. I think it's a bit tenuous, but I think it could be a valid claim. As part of the scheme, defendants required their artists, creatives, musicians, and producers to visit strip clubs. This is just like the Lizzo lawsuit. This is just like the Lizzo lawsuit in, in, in this respect. They made me go to a strip club. They made me grab her ass, made me have sex with a with a hot, hot sex worker. And it just, I'm having a hard time with that. I am. I am. Cause here you are taking selfies at the strip club. What was the what was the harm to you? What was the damage to you for this? Him groping you, him threatening you, Cuba Gooding Jr. groping you, all of those actionable. This, I don't know. I, I would love to hear somebody say, and this is the thing, if you think differently from me and you're like, no, Natalie, this is a valid claim because of X, Y, Z, this part, please put it in the comment section down below. Set me straight, sound off, give me your opinion. Defendants required their artists and so forth to visit strip clubs wearing exclusive, authentic bad boy merchandise and to use the name and reputation of Mr. Combs to solicit sex workers and prostitutes. So you solicit sex workers and prostitutes, which sex workers, that's just the term that you need to use. That's, that's, that's the only term. So you use his money and his image to solicit sex workers. You have sex with these sex workers. You bring them to Diddy. And you are the victim in this? I don't know. Additionally, Mr. Combs used the prospects of winning Grammy Awards. Ah, oh, that irks me. Purchasing $20 million homes, you're never going to get a $20 million home from him. That was never going to happen. Participating in future pro projects, that's too speculative to sue about. Making $250,000 cash payments and meeting influential music industry executives, which you admit that you did meet because you said he flaunted them in your face. <clears throat> this pattern of false representations was disseminated to artists and so forth in Florida and New York and California and around the country by defendants based in California, Florida and New York. Under the direction on behalf of defendants in New York, the dissemination typically use interstate telephone wires, social media messages, and electronic mail. Making promises to people on the phone is not a crime. That's not a crime. That's not a tort. I don't think, I don't think any of this is actionable. The, uh, uh, not of the entire lawsuit, but this section, I don't think is actionable. We're going to skip some of this. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Let's get to the next section. Wow. Okay. Upon information and belief, defendant Lucian Charles Grange, in his capacity as CEO of UMG, authorized Motown Records, Universal Music Group, to provide financial resources to Sean Combs and Love Records through wire transfer to defendant Sean Combs and Love Records. That's not in inherently nefarious. He's getting paid. Okay. Upon information and belief, Mr. Ms. Greenhill ensured the writing funds tra transfer. I'm sorry, what's wrong with me? Ensured the wiring funds transfer or cash payments to sex workers were completed. Okay, that is a problem. Christina Corum, through her direct reports uh, to Frankie San Santella, Moy Bond, and Brendan Paul, would negotiate the fees the sex workers received and would ensure that the workers are paid in one of the manners detailed above. How is that a tort against you? He, um, his people arranged sex workers. I don't see how that's a tort against you. 
I don't. With Cassie, it was different because she was forced, she said, to participate in these freak offs. He's saying that in order to keep Diddy's good favor, he felt like he had to have sex with these female sex workers without Diddy even being there. So for what gratification for Diddy? I don't even know. He's not in the bedroom with you. So I don't understand how he is a plaintiff for this particular portion. Defendant Sean Combs bragged about having several women on a monthly stipend. Okay. That's his business. That's his business. According to Plaintiff Jones, the women who receive these payments are Carisha Romika Brownlee. Okay. That's their business. Jade Ramey. Oh, that's Young Miami. She's one of the rappers. So Car Carisha, Carisha, please. Like she has like a, a podcast you can find on YouTube, but she's one of the rappers in the rap group. And she's, she's in the thumbnail in the rap group City Girls. And she has this like best friend, Saucy Santana, and they would get on Instagram live and make these really funny Instagram lives where he would say, Carisha, please, Carisha, please. And they have these like really thick Florida accents, Miami accents. They're, she's very adorable. I find her and JT to be so adorable. However, if she's harming people, let's talk about it. She's not a name, a name defendant in this case, but he's definitely throwing her name under the mud. So she's saying she got her cousin um, performed oral sex on him against his will, according to Mr. Jones. And um, now he's saying that uh, she receives a monthly stipend from Diddy, as well as Jade Ramey and Daphne Joy Cervantes Narvaez, a.k.a. Daphne Joy, who were paid a monthly fee to work as Mr. Combs' sex workers. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's really, this is really messed up. What are we defining a sex worker as? What are we defining a sex worker as? I'm a rich guy and, um, good night, Muzzy Bear. Um, I'm a rich guy. And I have several girlfriends and I pay them a monthly stipend to be my girlfriend. Is that the lifestyle that I would participate in? No, because it's, that's not for me. I'm pro monogamy for me. Okay. But is that prostitution? I do not know. I know that one of these women, for those of you that don't know, one of these women is um, the... In my, in my culture, we call this a kept woman. She's kept. You're kept. You're kept. He's paying for you, for you to be his exclusive girl, right? So I guess that could be sex work, but that could be a couple of other things. Um, but anyway, if you're getting paid by the same I don't know, sugar daddy situation, maybe. Hmm, I don't know. Anyway, one of these women, I think it's Daphne Joy, but I'm not 100% sure, is 50 Cent's child's mother. And now he has used this filing, the rapper 50 Cent, to file his own claim in court to request full custody of his son because Daphne Joy is alleged to be a sex worker in this lawsuit. And I just want to say this um, because I saw someone else do a poll of this on Twitter. I think it was Popcorn Planet. And I have to agree with his um, conclusion, actually. All right. And. I do not think that, let's say worst case scenario, she's a sex worker. She gets paid a monthly stipend by Diddy for her to be on call for Diddy whenever he wants her, right? And I know that Diddy and 50 Cent, they have beef. 50 Cent has beef with everybody. It's whatever. Now he wants his child because his mother is engaged, the child's mother is engaged in sex work. I think that that's offensive for anyone. There are male and female sex workers because uh, just and I'm not saying she is a sex worker. I'm not saying she is in this agreement. I really don't know. But let's say she is just just for the sake of argument. Even if she is, that does not make you automatically a bad mother. It does not. OK, um, that does not mean that you don't get up every day, get in the line you know, the car line and drop your kid off to school, make sure they have breakfast, lunch and dinner, go over their homework with you. And then when your kid is in school, you go do a little sex work. That doesn't mean that you should lose custody of your child. If you're Daphne Joy, thank you. If you're, if you're doing sex work, but your child has all their daily needs met and you're emotionally and financially available to them, then I do not think that that makes you a bad parent. 
I don't. And you know that I'm of the idea that sex work is work, right? Something can be something that's not for me, but I still don't judge you for it. I think sex work is work. And there are unhealthy forms of sex work for sure. There are dangers to sex work for sure. A lot of those dangers come from the fact that it is illegal in most places. And anytime something is illegal and unregulated, there are dangers that come along with it. Sex workers are at a high risk of being killed by the people that patronize them. All of those things, you know, I'm, I'm so concerned about all those things. But if in every other aspect, she is a good mother to her child, I don't think 50 Cent should try to take her child away from her. And the other concern I have about this is that this child that he is trying to take away from Daphne Joy is the child that he basically threw his other child away from. So 50 Cent used to have a, I'm not used to have, he does have a son who is an adult now, a, uh, like early 20s, late teens adult, right? And that son looks exactly, exactly like him. But then he had this child with Daphne Joy and he had no more interest in this, this son of his. And the older son is clearly very upset at the lack of a relationship with his dad. And so instead of trying to alienate your child from his mother, why don't you try to mend fences with your son and have a relationship with him? You know, I just, I don't like that. Don't try to take the woman's child away. She said that she moved to New York to be closer to 50 cents so that he could see his child more frequently and only saw the child maybe 10 days out of the year when she moved to make the child be closer. So I don't think that that's right. Um, and I don't think that he really has a genuine interest in the child. I think he just wants to hurt the mother because he's mad that she was having sex with Diddy in exchange for money, it sounds like, allegedly. So anyway, off my soapbox, let's continue. And I like how you guys are providing what you define sex work to be in the comment section. Thank you very, very much. So... And he's he little little Rod has thrown Carisha, um, Young Miami, like and Young Miami's cousin and all that stuff into this lawsuit over and over again when it doesn't appear that she's done anything to him. Her name is being brought up so much, and she hasn't done. He didn't say like, "Oh, she beat me. She sexually assaulted me. Oh, she she took drugs across state lines." He alleged, and she receives a stipend from Diddy. He alleged, and so I don't. I really don't feel like that these arguments, these particular arguments are in good faith. Some of them are, but these ones aren't. Based on information belief, they received payment via wire transfer from Robin Greenhill. It is unclear if they were provided the appropriate United States federal tax documents for these payments. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't mean this in a prohibitive way. Like I don't want people to not, you know, tell when they see crimes. I'm not like, but this dude is big snitching. That's really what he's <laughs> doing. Cause he don't have nothing to do with you. I don't hate federal government. I don't know if they declared the sex work on their taxes, but you might want to look at that. Mr. IRS. <laughs> Cause this has nothing to do with any claim against him. Okay. During the 10 years preceding the filing of this action into the present, all defendants did cooperate jointly and severally in the commission of three or more predicate acts. So they committed crimes in furtherance of this RICO. Um, we're not going to go through each one of them. So they committed multiple acts of sex trafficking in violation of 18 USC 1591, sex trafficking of children or by force, fraud or coercion in furtherance of the enterprise. I don't see how he can sue for this. I need somebody. Hold on one second. Hold on. I don't see how he can sue for this. Hold on. Give me a second. Phone a friend. My friend didn't answer. Yeah, so Robin Greenhill is mentioned in this lawsuit and she is alleged to have coordinated the payments to the women that, that Diddy keeps on a stipend. So, you know, it is what it is. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, the, these alleged acts of sex work are taking place across multiple states. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip some of this because it's a lot. Okay. Uh, Plaintiff Jones was forced by defendants Sean Combs and Christina Corum to send Ubers to... This is what, how are you going to prove that they forced you to do this? He sent Ubers to transport sex workers to and from Combs' homes. Did you also have sex with them? Then you're participating in the sex trafficking. We have the complete text thread and have intentionally opted not to include it here to protect the identity of the sex worker. Combs forced Mr. Jones to have sex with the sex worker against his will. According to Mr. Jones, defendant Combs felt there was too much testosterone in the studio and wanted sex workers there to create the vibe for the love album. You've already said this. You're repeating yourself. Oh, my God. Okay, so, again, if there is evidence that he was forced or threatened, like, if you don't have sex with these sex workers, I'm going to kick your ass. You're going to lose your job. I'm going to kill you if you don't have sex with these prostitutes then sure, actionable. But if you're like, I felt like I should have sex with the prostitutes because everybody else was doing it, that's not actionable. Not in my opinion. Oh, Lord. So we got all these sex workers, all of them. Okay, so many sex workers, so many of them. Okay. And so basically they sent sex workers across state lines. They sent drugs across state lines. And he felt like he was forced to have sex with these people and forced to take these drugs. According to Mr. Jones, the Combs Enterprise defendants informed the members and associates of the enterprise that it would be safe to transport narcotics through, the, through in their carry-on luggage because according to a TSA advisory, TSA security offers do not search for marijuana or other illegal drugs. The following is a screenshot of a, di of a video taken on Mr. Combs's yacht on or about December 25th, 2022 at 2.40 a.m. Brendan Paul, Brendan Paul has been turning up is videotaped with one of the black pouches defendant Combs and Christina Corum required the associates and members of Combs Rico Enterprise to carry. This pouch was filled with ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, mushrooms, and tuck or tooch, tooch or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how you say it. But anyway, this is him. These are pill bottles. This is the bag. And he's like, he made his employees carry drugs in their bags. Okay. The pattern of racketeering. Okay. Okay. Defendant committed multiple acts of mail fraud. <laughs> How do you have standing to sue somebody for committing mail fraud? But the feds will definitely investigate. Okay, so you, you committed mail fraud, committed multiple acts of wire fraud. Um, they divide and participate in a scheme to defraud plaintiff out of money in reliance on the mail. Defendants committed these acts with the intent to defraud plaintiff Jones and the artists, creators, and musicians and producers. Let's, let's hear about you. Specifically, good, Defendants agreed to each of the acts of wire fraud described throughout this complaint. In addition, defendants agreed to rely on interstate wires to disseminate funds and submit payments to sex workers and prostitutes, as well as to transfer payments for the distribution and procurement of drugs and guns. Defendants illegally acquired wire transfers, money transfers, credit cards, bank cards, via search engines and other online platforms to further their collective goal of furthering their RICO enterprise. Defendants knew that these online purchases were illegally made. Defendants agreed that defendants should facilitate these fraudulent purchases. Okay, child, please. Okay. Plaintiff require, request that this court issue an order and grant judgment to the plaintiffs below. Granting plaintiffs statutory. This is only the first cause of action and we're on page 68. Oh my word. Oh my goodness. Wow. So you want damages because he broke the law. Okay. Here we go. Sexual assault and sexual harassment. Actual, factual torts, claims that a plaintiff can raise against a defendant. The federal government will prosecute you for RICO, not private citizens. But anyway, this is something you can actually take action on. So uh, Combs frightened and placed plaintiff in apprehension of harm when he physically, uh, this is, these are the claims I take much more seriously, much more seriously. Cause the other ones, those were about getting the attention. You've got our attention. Here's the actual claim that I think is important. He physically and sexually assaulted him from October, 2022 to October, 2023 in Mr. Combs's home in Miami or homes in Miami, New York. So he does still have that house, the United States Virgin islands and Los Angeles. 
Mr. Combs forcibly touched and attempted and or threatened to touch plaintiff's intimate areas and or touch plaintiff with his own intimate body parts. So in the original complaint, it said anus. And I remember saying in my complaint in my um, uh, stream that that is not the appropriate term. I, from the context, it's clear that he meant like buttocks and not anus. So it's clear that they figured it out, that they don't that they're using the incorrect anatomical terms. But anyway, he threatened to touch plaintiff's intimate areas and touched his plain, his areas with uh, plaintiff's own intimate body parts or with defendant's own intimate body parts. Combs violently gripped. Oh, here we go with anus again. That is not the right term. You cannot palm somebody's anus. <laughs> I'm saying this, but we're all adults here and we have to use adult terms. Okay. This, this is the, it is page 60 something where we're finally getting to the actual complaint. It is driving me crazy. And no, you cannot palm someone's anus. You mean buttocks. That is what you mean. This lawsuit was drafted for the feds. So yes, absolutely clip this. Clip this and we're going to have to bleep that word, but they'll know what I'm saying. You cannot. It is anatomically impossible to palm an anus. <laughs> That's not what you mean. Stop saying that. <laughs> we all have them, okay? And we know that you can't do that. Buttocks is what you mean. Good Lord. <laughs> it's driving me crazy. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Combs violently gripped and palmed Mr. Jones's anus and crotch with, it's, it's not funny. Stop making me laugh. Because this is the serious part. It's just that I just hate his lawyer. I do. I hate his lawyer so much because this man was allegedly sexually assaulted and his lawyer was like, burn book. We're making a burn book. Mr. Combs forced Mr. Jones to work in Mr. Combs's bathroom and watch Mr. Combs as he showered. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like something inappropriate that a rich person would do and is potentially actionable. I don't want to do anything while my boss is showering. I don't even want to be on the phone with my boss while they're showering. I don't want to talk to my boss and think that they're naked. Nope, 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 nope. So I, that could be harassment. He forced Mr. Jones to work in the studio while Mr. Combs stripped naked to get his body massaged. I've seen Combs being massaged in the studio before. So I would like to see the full context of this interaction, but we'll see. Mr. Combs forced, forced Jones to work while Combs walked around naked. Okay, that could be sexual harassment, potentially. As a result of his conduct, plaintiff has suffered and continues to suffer harm, physical injury, severe. I don't know what physical injury you suffered from having your anus popped. I am so much trouble. I am going to be so canceled for this live stream. I am so sorry. I'm not trying to make fun of the actual as alleged assault. That's not it. It's just the bad term of phrase that is bothering me. And there's no physical injury alleged here or no mechanism by which physical injury could have been created. So it's emotional distress. It's humiliation, anxiety, harm, all of those things. But it's not physical injury. There are torts that actually do create physical injury. Like, oh my goodness, this person beat me up. I have a physical injury as a result of that. That's not what happened here. So I wish it would be more particular in the language. The language in this lawsuit, in the original lawsuit, in the amended complaint, has always been too colloquial for me. I just don't like it. It bothers me. So that's what I'm complaining about. Like, consult with a sexual assault expert to know the appropriate language to use when filing one of these claims so that they're taken seriously, but also so that they accurately describe the tort that your client suffered. A tort is just a civil harm, right? It's not a crime. It's a tort. That's what a tort is when I keep saying that. Okay. Mr. Combs' conduct described above was willful, wanton, and malicious. At all relevant times, Combs acted with conscious disregard for plaintiff's rights and feelings, acted with the knowledge of or with reckless disregard for the fact that his conduct was sure to cause injury and or humiliation to plaintiff and intended to cause fear, physical injury, and or pain and suffering to plaintiff. By virtue of the foregoing, plaintiff is entitled to recover punitive damages. Third cause of action sexual assault against Jane Doe 1, Young Miami's cousin. 
which tells me you don't know her name. And so you can only know, you know, basically designate her as young Miami's cousin. But I wish that throughout this. So the appropriate way to handle that is at the very beginning of your lawsuit, right? You say young, Mi you say Jane Doe one in the caption. And then when you're describing each of the parties, you'll say, Jane Doe one is young Miami's cousin. And you go throughout the entire complaint calling her Jane Doe one. You do not call her young Miami's cousin throughout the entire lawsuit. You call her Jane Doe one. That's what you call her. Okay. It's, it's, this is not well written. Mr. Jones incorporates this as described above Jane Doe one frightened in place. Hold on one second. I hear pitter patter. One moment, please. My husband is out there being so silly. <laughs> He's enjoying the dogs. Okay, let me get back to it. Um, Jane Doe 1 forcibly touched and attempted or threatened to touch plaintiff's intimate areas and or touch plaintiff with her own intimate body parts. She used her mouth and performed oral sex on plaintiff while he was urinating in the restroom. The plaintiff fought her off while Mr. Combs and his associates sat outside loudly laughing. Jane Doe one then followed Mr. Jones outside of the restroom again, undressing in front of Mr. Combs and his associates straddled Mr. Jones and attempted to have forced sexual intercourse with him. All of this is inappropriate. This is sexual assault and men can be sexually assaulted. If a man says no, and you still proceed to, you know, get on him and do all that stuff. You are a predator child. So absolutely. If proven in court, this is valid, at least on its face, this is a valid basis to bring a lawsuit, right? The courts will determine if it's true or not, but this is definitely a valid basis to bring a lawsuit. There's a lot of other things before this that I was just like, nah, man. Okay, premises liability for the sexual assault committed by Jane Doe, one against Mr. Combs. Um, Mr. Jones was sexually assaulted by Jane Doe one. So basically he's saying that because I, I can explain this without reading the whole thing. This was Sean P. Diddy Combs' home, Puff Daddy's house. And the sexual assault happened in Puff Daddy's house. He created the unsafe environment for that sexual assault to happen in. And so he is also liable for uh, Jane Doe 1 committing a sexual assault against him. That's what premises liability is. Um, and then Cuba Gooding Jr., this happened, on, I think, on the boat or in the studio. I can't really remember, but it's on video. And that by Combs having the location in which this happened and it was being an unsafe environment and fostering that unsafe environment on his premises, he is also liable for the sexual assault. And that could, so there could be hypothetical situations in which say you are, you know, you're at work and your job has this disgusting culture of sexual assault. You're sexually assaulted and the boss does nothing about it and they don't care. Your boss could also be liable, right, for keeping a certain premises in a way that, you know, makes those things happen. So that is a legally cognizable claim, uh, a, a bit tenuous. They're not very easy to prove, but it's a it's a claim. It's one that can be brought. Trafficking and Victims Protection Act. Defendant Sean Combs and Justin Combs and all the other people assisted, supported and facilitated a sex trafficking venture. Defendants knowingly and intentionally recruited, enticed, provided, and so forth, and solicited by various means, Mr. Jones, knowing that defendant Combs and so forth would use means of force, threats, or force, threats of force, fraud, coercion, to cause Mr. Jones, as well as others, some of whom were under the age of 17, to engage in commercial sex acts. Basically, I was coerced and forced to have sex with sex workers and have sex acts with sex workers. And he did that with some people who were under the age of 18. That has been alleged further up in the complaint. Um, 
aiding, abetting, and inducing sex trafficking. So basically, uh, this is against the people that own Universal mu Music Group, which is Lucy and Charles Grange. He knew or should have known that Diddy was um, engaged in sex trafficking. And by paying Diddy for his producer work or his, you know, music mogul work, then he was enabling Biddy, uh, Biddy, Diddy to um, engage in sex trafficking is what this claim is essentially saying. I'm not reading through all that because it's really a repeat of things that have already been said, but that's essentially what he's getting at. Um, eight cause of action, NIED for sexual assault against Jane Doe One. Um, his, uh, Jane Doe One, this is Young Miami's cousin's contact, created an unreasonable risk of emotional harm. Okay, negligent infliction of emotional distress. So she should have known that by performing oral sex on him without his consent, he would be emotionally distressed, and she did it anyway. And it was wanton, malicious, willful, or cruel. Uh, negligent infliction of emotional distress against Sean Combs. Um, and that by doing all the things that he did that were named above, it caused emotional distress and that Combs knew or should have known about the cause of about causing emotional distress to Jones. OK. Intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is really, really hard to prove. The Jane Doe knew that by attempting to have oral sex with him or having oral sex on him without his will, performing it on him without his will would cause him extreme emotional distress. Right. Um, and the same thing for Mr. Combs. He knew that it would cause the emotional distress and he did it anyway, maliciously, wantonly. The same thing, inflict intentional infliction of emotional distress for Cuba Gooding Jr. where he says Cuba Gooding Jr. groped him against his will and this caused him extreme emotional distress is what he's saying. And the same thing again for negligent infliction of emotional distress against Cuba Gooding Jr. This should have been included up where he had the negligence claims. This is out of order, but that's just a stylistic issue. And uh, sexual assault against Cuba Gooding Jr. So he's saying that in the U.S. Virgin Islands, he was physically and sexually assaulted by Cuba Gooding Jr. He was frightened. He was face placed in apprehension that he would be sexually assaulted. He forcibly touched him, attempted and or threatened to touch his intimate areas with his own intimate body parts. Gooding Jr. used his hand and forcibly touched plaintiff while he was sitting on the yacht he pushed him off and uh combs failed to intervene did combs have a duty to intervene that's going to be a question what part of his body of gooding's body touched what part of plaintiff's body is not totally clear from the lawsuit but if it's any of his intimate areas the behind the penis anything like that that could be sexual assault as a result of his conduct he suffered and continues to suffer from harm physical injury no you didn't Emotional distress, possibly humiliation, possibly anxiety, and other consequential damages. The conduct was willful, wanton, and malicious. Fifteenth cause of action. My God in heaven. Fifteenth cause of action. Page 81 of 98. Um, knowing beneficiary in a sex tra traffic adventure. So basically, this is, again, UMG Music Group. They know that sex trafficking is occurring on Diddy's level, so they're over Diddy. Diddy and all his people are engaging in sex trafficking. Allegedly, UMG knows it and they continue to pay Diddy. That's what that is saying. Okay. And I'm going to go through all of that, that they continue to pay Diddy. I don't see how he has standing to bring this claim because again, he is not the victim of the sex trafficking. The sex workers are not him. If in fact there are any victims, because not every time that sex work is involved is there a victim perpetrator dynamic. Sometimes you have two consenting adults that have agreed to have sex in exchange for money. That does not mean that it's sex trafficking. However, it can be. And just because I say that doesn't mean that the law looks at it that way. That's just how I see it. But, you know, again, it can be. And so the, it begs the question, what did UMG Music Group know? Okay. So they're saying basically we've got supporting documents to show that UMG knew that they were engaged in sex trafficking. Obstruction of the enforcement of the sex, excuse me, obstruction of the enforcement of the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. How can you sue for this? You are not a trafficking victim. Defendants Lucian Charles Grange in his capacity as CEO of UMG um, knowingly and intentionally obstructed and attempted to obstruct 
interfere with and prevented the enforcement of the sex trafficking acts, which basically makes it illegal to move people across state lines for the purpose of sex trafficking. Um, okay. He has a, okay, so Sean Combs has a well-documented history of criminal investigations. Lucy and Charles Grange, but not criminal investigations for sex trafficking before Cassie filed her lawsuit. So up until that point in time, what were they on notice of? But you need, but maybe he has some evidence of that, or the discovery process will reveal it. But that still leads me to the question of: Is he the correct plaintiff to bring this case, or is that something that's better suited for the federal government to investigate, which it seems like they're doing? Defendants Lucy and Charles Grange, in his capacity as CEO of UMG, should have taken a cue from the federal prosecutor's arrest and prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein. Honor about that. What? What? What are you talking about? That doesn't even make any sense. Jeffrey Epstein is a completely unrelated case to Sean P. Diddy Combs. You have presented in this lawsuit no evidence of a relationship between Epstein and Sean P. Diddy Combs. So just because Epstein is arrested and prosecuted and then unalives himself because of sex trafficking and being a pedo and a disgusting, pervert, nasty, dirty man, I'm so glad he's dead, right? Just because that happened doesn't mean that this company should be on notice that one of the companies underneath them and the CEO of that company is engaged in sex trafficking. I don't think that that's a fair burden to put on companies. Does that mean that every single company has to rework all of their contracts because Jeffrey Epstein was found out, sussed out and criminally prosecuted? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. He brings up Jelaine Maxwell as Epstein's co-conspirator, but it has nothing to do with this case. And once that is my biggest problem with this lawsuit is that you're bringing up all these people, be they whether they have good or bad reputations that literally have nothing to do with this lawsuit. And you're just bringing them up for the salaciousness factor. Oh, well, because of Jeffrey Epstein, UMG Music Group should have known that P. Diddy was a sex trafficker and a gun trafficker and a drug trafficker. No, I don't think so. I'm sorry. Upon information and belief, by providing financing to Combs Sex Trafficking Organization, it's not a sex trafficking organization. He is maybe committing sex trafficking. Maybe a court of law would later on find that it was essentially an organization in furtherance of sex trafficking. But to UMG Music Group, it's Bad Boy Entertainment. It's Love Records. It's the Love Album. It has nothing to do with sex trafficking. You need to show evidence that these people actually knew that this stuff was going on. And I have my doubts. We'll see. Defendant Lucian Grange, in his capacity of CEO of all these companies, obstructed, attempted to obstruct. This is a conclusion. This is a conclusion. What's the, what's the facts? All right? Okay. Um, he provided financial resources to Mr. Combs, and so that the coercive commercial sex acts would escape the detection of state and federal law enforcement and prosecuting agencies. Lucian Charles Chain Grange, in his capacity as CEO, provided financial resources to further the Mr. Combs, defendants Jay Combs, and so on, and her direct reports. This is very poorly written. Basically, they gave money to all of these people and their underlings, and this funded their sex trafficking enterprise, is what he's saying. But I don't see... Um, where they show knowledge. Okay. Defendants Lucian Shaw in his capacity, blah, 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 failed to ensure that their general business partners, Sean Combs and Love Records, timely and accurately reported to the federal government the required tax forms that detailed the partnership payments provided by defendants Lucian Charles Gray in this capacity. Timely filing of these reports is required in the United States tax code. That has nothing to do with sex trafficking. This doesn't have anything to do with this is okay. They didn't file their taxes in a timely manner. Most rich people don't. I don't see how that's relevant to sex trafficking. Okay. Okay. This there's just too much. There's too much that's not relevant. Lucian Grange, for example, they knew that Combs was high risk. How did they know that? Okay. So let me show, show you right here. So this defendant, Lucian Grains, knew that 
Mr. Combs was high risk, specifically high risk to violate to violate the, you know, um, Trafficking Victims Protection Act through continuing criminal sex trafficking activities. As evidenced by Cassie Ventura's civil complaint, but that came after all of your events, she informed members of Combs' parent label about the abuse. Oh, okay, 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 okay. That's right, that's right, that's right. Okay, 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 okay. This is a good point. This is a good point by plaintiff's counsel. Okay, let me point this out. We went through the Cassie lawsuit. Cassie said, child, come on in now. Cassie said, okay, let me let me get you a little bit closer. Cassie said that she told Diddy's parent company that essentially Diddy was holding her hostage. She did not want to go back, holding her hostage with her music career. And they were just basically like, sorry, you've got to submit to Diddy, you know, like, or you can go, please give him a call. Basically, they participated in forcing her to go back to him time and time again. And did he have this coercive control over her? And she let them know that. So that could be evidence of knowledge. If they could get those communications between Cassie and whatever businesses that Diddy is associated with, where she's like, hey, these crazy things are happening. I need help to escape. Then... Yes, that could be evidence of consciousness or awareness of the sex trafficking. So I'll give you that. You ate that one little thing. You ate that one little thing, but I'll give you that for sure. Okay. So they could have known based on what Cassie said. Okay. They were made aware of this through complaints made by Cassie made my made by Cassie Ventura and the lawsuit by former Diddy sex worker, Jonathan Adi. Defendants Lucian Charles Grange in his capacity of CEO of UMG, et cetera, concealed from the federal government its numerous financial payments to Mr. Combs and Love Records. How do you know this? I don't know. If it's concealed from the federal government, how do you know? I, I won't say it's not true. I just would like to know the source of that information. Um, so that he could make payments to his co-conspirators with knowledge that such transactions did not produce a clear paper trail, but no one's going to pay prostitutes and money and then claim it on their taxes. No one's going to do that, but he, but that can get you in trouble with the feds. Absolutely. Defendants, Lucy and Charles Grange in his capacity, intentional conduct obstructed, attempted to obstruct in many ways, interfered with and prevented the enforcement of the, uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act by investigators and prosecuting agencies. That's the conclusion. I'd like to see something where they obstructed an investigation. Okay. Okay. 17th cause of action. Finally, we get to the breach of contract. It took us 95 pages. Oh my word. It took so long that is your strongest claim. We had an oral contract. He was going to give me all this stuff and he didn't do it. And you're going to save it for last. Breach of contract is the most easy to understand. And like I said, verbal contracts, they are contracts. They're just a little hard to prove, but they're contracts. So let's dig into this. Oh my God. And matter of fact, let me just take a little break real quick. Why am I frustrated? <laughs> Why am I frustrated? I am frustrated because I want to see the legal profession do well and be ethical in all that we do. And that includes even when we're filing lawsuits against people, not to dis besmirch people unnecessarily, drag them into lawsuits unnecessarily where they don't need to be, and to stick to the claims and the facts that support that claim. So it took us 90 something pages to finally get to breach of contract, which is really the essence of this thing. If he had been paid, he probably would have never even brought this lawsuit. He didn't seem to care about none of them sex workers until he did not get his mansion in the Hamptons. Anyway, plaintiff Jones and defendants, Mr. Combs and LR had an oral contract for Mr. Jones to receive $20,000 for every song he produced on the love album. I want to see the written contract because I'm sure there is one. I'm sure there is one. Let's see. Combs agreed to allow Jones to keep his publishing 
four royalty points per song and to credit him as a producer. Jones fully executed his obligations under the contract when he produced these following songs, which we don't care about. Jones worked on these songs, which we also do not care about. Jones lived and traveled with Combs from 2022 to 2023. Through the duration of that time, Combs did not compensate Jones for his time or the work he did on the above mentioned songs. Here's what Combs' attorneys are going to say. Did you get free food? Did you get free lodging? Did you get free equipment? Did you get free sex workers? Did you get free drugs? You was in there boozing it up, doing all the drugs, sleeping with all the sex workers, living in his mansion, being on yachts, flying in private jets. You had no complaints. That is compensation. Okay? Somebody's going to say that. Somebody's going to say that. Whether it's right or wrong, that could be a form of compensation. Mr. Combs also failed to provide Jones with producer credit or four royalty points for all songs. As a result, Jones has suffered losses of $180,000 royalty points and credit for the following songs that we don't care about. As a result of these actions, Jones has suffered these losses. $40,000 for royalty points for these songs that we also don't care about. And because of the breach of contract, he suffered and continues to suffer harm, severe emotional distress, anxiety, and other consequential damages. And we want monetary damages, and other release, relief. And because he was willful and malicious and wanton, we want punitive damages, prayer for relief. I want you to note that this prayer for relief has come up twice which is how badly written this lawsuit is he's also asked for a jury trial which um our former president forgot to do in one of his cases so his, at least his attorney did not forget to do that but anyway um that th they forgot to cut out the previous prayer for for relief it's it's up further in the lawsuit and now here it is again now i must have missed prince harry so let's find prince harry in here because he did come up and as you guys know I enjoy a little royal family gossip. So Prince Harry is mentioned. However, Prince William and Prince Harry are in a picture at a tribute to Princess Diana event in like 06. So almost 20 years ago with Diddy and um, Kanye. And they're all st stood in, you know, stood in the line talking and laughing. There's a picture of them. And now he ends up Prince Harry is in the lawsuit. So let's see what it says. Upon information and belief, the financial benefits of the defendant Grange received for participating in and facilitating Combs' sex trafficking venture were the affiliation and access to his popularity. So basically, Grange, by affiliating himself with Combs, who was a sex trafficker, he got these benefits from it. Before Cassie's lawsuit was filed, Combs was a popular and highly influ influential figure in the music industry to whom everyone wanted to connect. True. Combs was known for throwing the best parties. I've also heard this. I'm sure many of you had. I'm not, I don't have any special no. It's just, that's what the streets be saying. Affiliation with and or general business partnerships with Mr. Combs garnered legitimacy, immense success, and access to top and emerging artists, celebrities, famous athletes, political figures, musicians, and international dignitaries like British Royal instead of Royals and Prince Harry. So the media, instead of saying, oh, um, he had an affiliation with these people and it garnered him legitimacy, right? And these include the British Royals. That's what he said, the British Royals. They forgot the S and Prince Harry. The media has been saying, Oh, Prince Harry has helped Sean P. Diddy Combs. That's not at all what's being say, said here. And Prince Harry is not even being um, exclusively mentioned. The British royal family includes Prince William, Princess um, or uh, Duchess Catherine, um, Meghan Markle, Princess Meghan, um, the King, King Charles, Camilla. Who else am I thinking about? And Andrew. Prince Andrew with his dirty self, right? All of those people are included in the British royal family, but Prince Harry, I guess maybe his name is like more controversial, more recognizable. So he's mentioned and signaled out. And he's also also kind of sort of left. He's no longer a, a working royal, the royal family. He's living in the US. So like he's signaled out, but they also say British royals. 
like British royals. So dignitaries like British royals. It does not mean that any of these people participated in any type of sex trafficking, drug trafficking, gun trafficking. And according to all the evidence, the last time Prince William and Prince Harry were in Sean P. Diddy Combs' presence was in 2006. So we really have to be very, very careful. And this goes, this extends to Prince William as well, because some people were also besmirching him as a, as a result. And I don't think that that was fair. I don't think that's a very fair assessment. Okay. No, Andrew has not been mentioned, but Andrew is a British royal. He is, you know, he just is. All right. I was just saying like, who's included in the British royal family? Because it says British royal, but what he really means is British royals because there's a lot of um, typos in this thing. Uh, guys, let's get to the super chats. And what's really interesting to me is that Epstein is mentioned over and over and over again. And, you know, I'm I'm glitching because I'm over two hours and that's what happens. So just deal with it because <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> but no, um, over and over and over again, Epstein has been mentioned, but no uh, relationship between Epstein and Diddy was ever mentioned in the lawsuit. So I thought that that was kind of interesting. La Mama T, welcome to the lawyer chicklets. As pretty does, welcome to the lawyer chicklets. Mech D's, welcome to the lawyer chicklets. Susan, welcome to the lawyer chicklets. Thank you for the super sticker, Laura Christine. That's very, very generous of you. Hello, Sussex Sandra. <laughs> A little something because YouTube can be oversensitive. Thank you so, so much. Big up to the Jamaican flag. Irene, I'm sorry if I, I don't want to say your name wrong, Irene. Thank you for being a member for 13 months. I appreciate you and I appreciate you too. Thank you so much. Cristobal San Pedro, thank you for the super sticker. Maddie Retman, thank you for the super chat. I feel like him settling was because he knew that Discovery was going to reveal all the illegal stuff he did was doing. Absolutely. And that's what some of Lil Rod's um, extra stuff is all about is you need to settle with me. I am going to embarrass you and expose you. And it might be too late now because the feds, the feds are watching. The feds are watching. Steven Delaville, thank you very much for the very, very generous, generous super sticker. Thank you. Peggy Cole, I know, I want to know who Diddy pissed off, has been a member for 17 months. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's a fall from grace of epic proportions, but it's been years since he became very wealthy that he's been accused of being a terribly exploitative businessman with these new artists that he was taking under his wing and just doing them terribly. So that was not new, but the sex stuff I did not know about. Thanks for not missing words. Love to you, Susie and doggies. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you so, so much. Nate, the lawyer. Hey, <laughs> Thank you so much for the super chat, Nate, the lawyer. It's so nice to see you, my friend. The lawyer trying to get the Cassie settlement. The more crazy, the more money. Absolutely. I don't know. It looks like he may get something out of this, but I just find it in bad faith, Nate, how much of this lawsuit is about salacious details that have nothing to do with the plaintiff. It's very, very interesting to me. Thank you for the super chat again, Peggy Cole. I appreciate you. Conspiracy, do you think if the person convicted of Tupac might be talking? I know it has been said Diddy had been. Interesting. There is a conspiracy theory that Diddy was behind the Tupac murder. I know nothing about it. I Don't sue me, Diddy. Don't try to recoup that money off of my back. I am just a lowly public defender and YouTuber. You can't get anything from me. Gifted 10 Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships from Lady Dracon. Bonus. Thank you so much. And welcome to all of you new members that are gifted memberships. Welcome aboard. Um, thank you, Lady Dracronis, for um, saying that it was great coverage and all you do. And it is a crazy story. Shawnee, thank you for the super sticker. Ashley at CC. Thank you. C and C. Uh, you know what, Ashley, you've been here for a while. Welcome on back to the membership. Thank you for being a lawyer, Chicklet. We love you. Thank you. K Bragg. Hey, girl. I got my tinfoil hat on, me too. Feeling like Lil Ron is a CI undercover asset who got infiltrated 
Diddy's camp to gather intel because his lawsuit eerily lays out the case for the feds. I ain't mad at it. It does. It reads like a federal indictment instead of a civil lawsuit. It's very interesting. Hey, Cristobal San Pedro, I will take your money. Thank you all guys so much for making this worth my time. You do help this channel to continue to grow. And although my camera is glitching because it is clearly not meant for live streaming anymore um there's a component in it that's a little burnt out and so that after two hours it just can't hold up anymore um there there has been such an improvement in equipment mic camera lighting all types of things that all of that is helped by you guys thank you so much k bragg thank you for the uh super chat i think it's sugaring which is sex work like a sugar baby, sugar daddy situation, which is sex work. And we were talking about young Miami and the other ladies in the harem. I hate to say that, but that's essentially what it is. Uh, is that sex work is what my question was. And I think a lot of you say that it is. Um, Lady T, my girl, thank you for gifting 10 Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. Thank you, K Bragg, for the extremely generous super chat. You can palm the, <laughs> if you spread the cheeks first, I just tested <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> so a donkey isn't a jack anus. Right. He's a jack ass. You can palm someone's ass. You cannot palm an anus. It's ridiculous. Naughty Aries. Nice to see you. Thank you for the super chat for the happiness and adorableness of the fur babies. Please record them playing as a treat. I will. I will. I will. Thank you. I'll put it up as a short for you guys. MK has been a member for 11 months. Thank you so much. Holy words, Batman. Yikes. It's a long tattletale. Very, very long. And the Shay Jones has been a member for 11 months. Thank you for continuing to support the channel. I really appreciate you. This lawsuit is trying to do way too much. Uh, it is. But you know what? He got what he wanted. He got a lot of attention, a lot, a lot of eyes on this lawsuit. Um, and even potentially stalked by a private investigator for Diddy, allegedly. Editor Danielle Marie sent a super sticker. Thank you so much, Danielle Marie. Okay, I want to thank all of you who were so kind to come out here tonight so that we could, uh, you know, really look at this very, very interesting case with a lot of twists and turns. One second. Hold on one second. Hold on. Let's do this. Okay, here we go. Aha. Okay, here I go. Yeah. with a lot of different twists and turns and um, all of your input and everything has been so helpful in uh, me understanding the case and I have enjoyed reading it so that I can kind of process it as well um, because you can't just go what off, off of what's put in the media. But yeah, I think this is a where there's smoke, there's fire, that there's a two things can be true at once situation going on here where I think there's a bit of manipulation and ex exploitation going on. They're looking for a big payday, but also something something might have happened to little Rod. So he might have been abused in some type of way. And so he may be deserving of something, but everything that he says, I don't think is suitable for a lawsuit. I want to thank all of you. Have a good night. Make sure that you like the video on your way out and I'll see you later. Bye.